Yanhuang Republic was a huge and dense country. Jing City was a huge metropolis city with a population of about 30 million. The enormous number of people made it the political center of the country. Out of the many districts in Jing City, Jingshan was one of the smallest districts. It was around 4 p.m. and the weather was pleasant outside the Jing City Jingshan Vocational School. There stood two shady-looking kids outside the school gate, hiding behind the gate walls. One of them, who appeared to be the junior one, asked the other if that kid would show up to school that day. They were told that kid came to the school daily to pick some girl up after school. The bossy shady kid made a bold claim that he would spell his name backwards if he did not teach that kid a lesson that day. However, his junior was not sure about that because he had heard that the kid had been practicing martial arts for over seven years then. But the bossy kid came prepared with his secret weapon in his fake school bag. They both quarreled for a bit before they saw the kid they were after, coming. The kid went to a girl and started chatting with her. They both chatted romantically like they were partners in a relationship. The junior and bossy kid both eavesdropped on the couple, and they found out that the guy's name was Xiao Yi, and the girl was his girlfriend, named Nana. Xiao Yi asked the girl about her plans for later that day. They both were free, so the girl agreed to go to his place. While their romantic talk was going on, the junior kid, named Vol, busted them and shouted at Xiao Yi. They both were furious and were ready to teach him a lesson. When Nana found out that the bossy kid was her boyfriend Chi Yue, she was surprised. She instantly told Yue that she was no longer interested in him, and she was Xiao Yi's now. Xiao Yi was also ready to fight for his new love, and he mocked Yue. He knew martial arts and his master was the famous king of kick, so he was quite confident. But soon, all his confidence dropped to ground level because Yue pulled out a brick from his fake school bag. He called it the martial arts of brick. In his childhood, Yue was an orphan who used to live in an orphanage, and there was no one to take proper care of him. Then he dropped out of his high school, and ever since that day people called him a loser. Yue and Nana had been dating for over a year, and because Yue had no family, Nana was very important to him. But that wasn't the case with Nana. When she found a better match for herself who was stable and rich, she cut off ties with Yue and jumped to Xiao Yi. This made Yue extremely depressed, and he came to take out his long built-up anger on Xiao Yi. On the other hand, Xiao Yi was not moved by seeing the brick at all. He was still confident and ready to face off Yue. He even stated that he could kick very swiftly, and his attack had a range of five feet, which meant that he could kick the brick away easily. As he was showing off his skills, in the blink of an eye, a red brick hit him in the face and knocked him down. It was Yue's brick, which he threw with full force at Xiao Yi. When Yue's junior Vol saw that his boss knocked down their arch nemesis, he also cheered for Yue. He was so inspired that he joined his boss too, and started punching Xiao Yi with bricks. Xiao Yi was being beaten up very gruesomely, and his head deformed with blood and swelling. Soon, there were sounds of murder echoing through the streets outside the school. Yue decided to take the responsibility for the murder, because Xiao Yi was in a very bad condition then, and the security was probably going to come soon. Do you want to know the name of this manga, along with all the manga names of the recaps we did in our channel? How about also the chapter numbers our recaps end? You can simply ask the names in our Discord community for free, or become a donor, to get them all in one place. You can either be a donor in Patreon, or be a member in our YouTube channel. Just scan this QR code, or go to the link in the description, to become a donor. Moreover, becoming a donor automatically makes you a VIP member of our Discord server, with over tens of thousands of members. He punched Xiao Yi one last time and told Vol to get out of there. They fled from the scene, and Vol was curious as to how that kid fell so quickly, but Yue was still bragging about the martial arts of Brick. After some rest, Yue told Vol to go home, and he himself decided to go somewhere far away secretly to evade the security because he created much trouble. Like a father figure, Yue instructed Vol to be a good kid and go to school and college. Before leaving, Vol gave Yue a smartphone and a debit card with 20,000 yuan in it so that he could stay in touch with him and informed him that the railway to Tibet was open so Yue could hide over there. Yue resisted, but Vol did not take those things back. Vol was hopeful that his dad would fix things up and then Yue would be able to return from hiding. Yue thanked Vol as he left. As soon as they both parted ways, Yue withdrew all his saved up credits and jumped on the train to Tibet that night. When his heartbeat came back to normal after beating up a person, he reflected on the sheer amount of price he had to pay for the train ticket. The ticket cost him 800 yuan, whereas his monthly income was around 500 yuan. He instantly regretted his decision and to make up for it he decided to stare at beautiful girls on the train, this way, he could fulfill his lust and make the train ticket worth the price. As soon as he started looking out for girls, all he saw were old ladies who were extremely excited to travel to Tibet, and one of them was someone's grandmother. 
Yue was very frustrated by the fact that an 800 yuan train ticket had no beautiful girls on board. He was about to throw away his ticket when a very charming and decent girl with a pleasing face came on board. She stopped just by his cabin. Yue was starstruck. He asked her if she was seated in that cabin, and to his surprise, she was. Yue's excitement turned into disappointment when she called him Mr., but he somehow started a conversation with her. His eyes turned red, as if he was hit by love at first sight. The innocent girl became concerned if Yue had altitude sickness because of his red eyes, but it was love and lust. Yue tried to flex his muscles and showed her that he was strong, so there was no chance he had altitude sickness. Then the pretty girl told him that her name was Shui Yue. Chi Yue was surprised that they had the same last name, and so he became even more interested in her. While they were chatting, Shui guessed that Yue was an artist traveling to Tibet. He instantly agreed and played along, and Shui was very interested in knowing more about him. She asked him more about his field. Yue was reluctant to answer that because he knew he could get busted, but when she insisted, he thought of a smart answer to make her even more interested. He told her he was an anatomy artist. Yue chatted about his totally made-up anatomy art for a long while before Shui finally went to sleep because of shyness. Yue was then on the search for more beautiful girls like Shui, but to his disappointment he only found retired beefy soldiers who were the train attendants. Everyone else was asleep. Yue was pretty bored himself and so he fell asleep too. While he was asleep, he saw a white palace in his dreams. The view was unclear and hazy, but someone called his name in the palace. He heard a man's voice calling him towards the palace for help, but the palace started drifting away from him. Yue was very confused and finally he woke up from the dream, but he still had the voice in his head. He saw Shui seated in front of him, and he himself was lying on a strange bed. He found out that he was in the infirmary, and he had been sleeping for more than 30 hours. The attendants were also very worried about him, because they had never seen a person sleep for more than 30 hours. They were about to take him to a hospital before the next stop. Although to Shui's surprise, Yue's pulse was totally normal, and there was nothing wrong with him. He himself was amazed that he had been asleep for that long, even though he just had a short dream. But he was more interested in the fact that Shui had been taking care of him for all that time. Then Yue tried to get up and go towards the cabin, but as soon as he stood up, he became very dizzy and couldn't keep his balance. He fell on top of Shui, and at that instant he realized that the train ticket was worth it. However, in the blink of an eye, she slapped him with a condensed yang hand technique, and the force was so much that he started bleeding and his face turned blue. The condensed yang hand technique was passed down to her from within her family. It was originally used for treatment, but it could also be used for self-defense because it was a very powerful technique. Shui had only used 30% of the technique power to slap Yue, but she was still afraid that she might have killed him, and she started to treat him immediately. She took off his shirt and saw that the technique had made his body react. But she noticed a big tattoo on Yue's chest. She turned him over and it continued to his back too. It looked like an invisible tattoo, which was usually made from pigeon blood mixed with herbs. The tattoo was almost perfect and made her believe that he really was an anatomy artist. When she turned him over again, she saw that the tattoo monster's horn had turned red and the swelling on his chest had also disappeared. She became confused as to what was going on, but decided to focus on keeping him alive. Then Yue touched himself unintentionally half asleep. He started to wake up, and when he was fully back up, he asked her again what had happened to him. She did not tell him about the slap, and instead dodged his question by saying something about altitude sickness. Yue felt very strange and lightweighted, and he decided to go back to the cabin with Shui. When he saw the beautiful scenery outside through the windows of the train, he became astonished. Shui explained to him the scenery. There were snowy mountains, and hundreds of Tibetan houses with prayer flags on them. She also told him about some majestic Patala Palace, after some chatting, the train reached its destination in Tibet. Yue was reluctant to part ways with the beautiful girl, but she said goodbye and hoped to meet him in Jing City again. Yue also called his partner Vol to give him a quick update. Then he decided to head towards the Patala Palace, and at that moment he knew that his journey had only just begun. Outside the palace, Yue met a man who was dressed very differently, and it appeared that he was a monk. He started to explain and list different facts about the Patala Palace to him. The Patala Palace used to be the Winter Palace for the Dalai Lamas back then, but now it was the political center of Old Tibet. He also came to know that the Patala Palace preserved a large number of rare treasures and ancient relics. On top of all that, there were murals that covered more than 2,500 square meters of area, and many Buddha statues as well. With all these facts coming at Yue, he thought the man was a salesman, and he told him that he was not interested in buying anything. The monk told Yue that he was not suitable for visiting the palace because his heart was impure, and he had no Buddha in his heart. To Yue's surprise, the monk knew about his strange dream about the palace. He told Yue that the voice calling him was to bring him there to meet the monk. 
Then the monk invited Yue to come with him to the Holy Buddha Temple, and a graceful Lincoln Navigator pulled up right there. As soon as Yue saw the beautiful car, he became inclined to go with the monk. Cars were Yue's hobby. He loved globally famous cars, including that Lincoln Navigator. So he jumped in the comfortable car seat and decided to go with the monk only because of the luxury SUV. When the car left the urban area, Yue became a bit concerned. He thought the monk was going to kidnap him and torture him. However, the monk was disappointed in Yue's thought process. He called him a ruffian and a loser with a rotten core. But Yue felt grateful and cocky for being called a loser, as if it was a compliment. When Yue was finally satisfied about the monk's motives, he drank a big bag of goat milk and fell asleep in the luxury heated car. Soon they arrived at the Holy Buddha Temple. Yue was confused as to why there were so many police soldiers outside the entrance of the palace, but the monk assured him it was because the temple was a national tourist reserve and a busy place. The temple was built right next to the mountains, so the peak of the temple was quite high. Yue had to climb countless stairs, and at the end his legs almost gave up, but they somehow reached the top. Yue was exhausted and angry because he only came with the monk because of the luxury car and the delicious goat milk. When the monk told him that he wanted to enlighten Yue there, and he was his guide, Yue became furious. He thought the monk was mocking him by calling him stupid. Yue had a tradition of making people pay for looking down on him or mocking him. He thought this was a way of protecting his dignity and his big ego. Though in this case, he held back because the other person was a monk. Yue said goodbye to the monk and was ready to leave the place because of this, but the monk was not ready to allow him to leave. The monk told him that there had always been people who silently protected the East with all their strength, and because of those people, the East had been in existence peacefully. These prominent guardian beings would appear once every thousand years. That was exactly what was about to happen to Yue. He was from the great bloodline that had been protecting the East. He was one of the prominent beings of that bloodline. However, Yue was unaware of all this, and he questioned if these people were immortal. He thought the monk was joking, and it was just a made-up story. The monk instructed Yue to take off his shirt if he wanted proof of all those things, but Yue wasn't ready to strip before a monk. He was eager to leave. The monk pulled Yue back to him through some majestic force in the air and forcefully made him take off his shirt. The reason Yue was not ready was because of his fear. The prominent guardians in the past were also stubborn, but only because of their mission, not fear. When the monk touched Yue's chest, Yue felt a surge of power in his body, and he started shivering. He thought the monk had drugged him, but then he saw a tattoo appear on his chest. There was a dragon tattoo on Yue's chest which proved that Yue was an Ink Kilin, the strongest among the Kilin clan. He was indeed one of the chosen prominent guardians. Yue's childhood dream was to become an extraordinary person, and it seemed to be coming true. He was fascinated and was ready to accept the monk's story then, but he knew the monk was not an ordinary monk either. So he questioned the monk about who he truly was. The Holy Buddha Temple was a sacred place for the monk, and his history was rich. The temple was inhabited by the most well-known master about ten years ago, but he passed away soon after. Before passing away, he had chosen that monk to inhabit the temple and gifted him with the place where the most precious scriptures were being kept. So the monk was kind of the abbot of the Holy Buddha Temple. He looked the same age as Yue, but his presence was far heavier and vast, like an ocean. When the monk told all of this to Yue, he agreed to listen to the monk. Then the first thing he told him was to call him Zagru. Then he told him about the tattoo on his body. The tattoo was called a Keelin, and it was related to his blood. Keelin was not a tattoo, but a symbol that had been sleeping on Yue's blood. It was a symbol of fortune and peace. Out of the many kinds of Keelins, Yue's was different. He had the most special and powerful one, the Ink Keelin, and Yue was the first one to inherit the bloodline of that Keelin. Yue thought of the tattoo as a cool tattoo like the gangsters had in movies, to which the monk was surprised. He couldn't get his head over the fact that Yue just compared Ink Keelin to a gangster's tattoo. Then the monk told Yue about the group of true patron saints whose mission was to protect the East from evil beings and foreign enemies. The patron saints group was led by twelve warriors who represented the twelve earthly branches. Yue did not know about the twelve earthly branches, so Zagru explained to him the twelve zodiac animals. The twelve zodiac animals each bore a character. Z, Cho, Yin, Mao, Chen, Si, Wu, Wei, Shen, Yu, Shu, and Hai were the twelve earthly branches, and they had been protecting the east. Yue's zodiac sign was the monkey, so he thought he was one of the patron saints because of that. But Zagru told him it was all about luck, and that the full power of the patron saints could only be achieved if they were all gathered in one place. There was also a leader that led the patron saints with unity. By hearing that, Yue's mind instantly figured out that he was the leader. The ink Keelan on his body was the biggest proof of that. Zagru took him there to awaken his Keelan's blood. Yue became curious as to what his duties were. 
Zagru told him that his mission was to protect the East in coordination with the patron saints. As the protector of the East and the leader of the patron saints, Yue could face difficulties from the West too. After clearing these things up, he was tired of all the talk. He approached Zagru with an innocent face and complimented him on being an honest and kind-hearted monk, and then immediately asked for permission to leave. Yue was not ready to become a hero. He knew it wasn't an easy task. He was to face very terrible enemies, and he wasn't ready to give up his life then. He was only 19 years old, and was eager to enjoy his life. He had seen dramas and read books, and knew that heroes could die before achieving anything at all. Yue was a nobody, and wanted to stay like that. Zagru was amazed that Yue did not want to become the king of the Zodiac. He asked Yue if he had any big wish in life. Yue replied with a strange wish. He wanted to sleep all day while swimming in cash, with beautiful girls on his doorstep, all while being healthy forever. These four combined were his biggest wish. Zagru was confident that Yue's wishes would come true someday, but only if he had power. With power, a person can achieve anything. With Yue being the Ink Keelan, he could have all the power in the East as the status of a Keelan was paramount. All the other patron saints would protect Yue at the cost of their own lives, but to unlock Yue's special abilities of the Ink Keelan, Zagru would have to enlighten him so that the bloodline of the Ink Keelan would fully awaken. By hearing all this, Yue was still confused because he knew that to become strong, one must go through struggles. But Zagru told him that the Ink Keelan possessed the ability of hyper-regeneration, so Yue was potentially able to recover from severe injuries in no time. He was still unsatisfied and ready to leave again, which made the monk a bit pissed off. He started to explain about the importance of the patron saints and tasked Yue with a mission. In the next few years, Yue had to find the other patron saints and train himself, and he would also get support from the powerful families of the protectors of the East. This way he could easily fulfill his wishes. Deep down, Yue had believed Zagru ever since the ink killin appeared on his body, but he was just playing hard to get. Yue's dream was to leave his name in history as a hero or a scoundrel. Either one would make him happy if people remembered him. After so much convincing, Yue was ready to accept Zagru's terms, but he also asked for his sincerity as well. He asked Zagru for a magical tool or weapon to better protect himself in the East. Zagru agreed to give him a magical bracelet. It was Zagru's most precious belonging given to him by his senior master. The bracelet had 17 beads on it, which were Sarira's from 17 deceased master's teeth. It could protect the wearer from any type of evil except monsters which were over a thousand years old. This magical bracelet was worn by the divine guide of each generation before him. To fully utilize the bead's powers, Yue had to train himself to have a better understanding of it. He was the only one to possess it after the divine guides. Surprisingly, Yue decided not to accept the bracelet. He thought it was too precious for him to take. But he saw truth in the monk's eyes, which was a very rare thing to see in that world. So, he accepted Zagru's terms but wanted to return the bracelet. After seeing this kindness, Zagru knew that Yue was destined to have the bracelet. He insisted on Yue keeping it as long as he used it for good cause. When Yue wore the bracelet, he felt a coolness in his hands and a refreshed body. The bracelet looked majestic on his hand. Zagru told him that the bracelet could prevent potential dangers to him during the Enlightenment period. And then they started their meditation. Yue sat down on a spot where even the ground had changed shape because the two previous masters used to meditate there for long periods. This showed that countless minutes of training could prove useful and influence a person in a positive way. Soon after, Zagru was ready to start the Enlightenment process. He asked Yue to close his eyes because the process of enlightening was like a dream. A bright light started shining in Zagru's forehead, which was the most precious and powerful treasure for the Buddhas, a living Sarira. Living Sariras had become almost extinct from that world. The living Sarira had an immense power of purity in it. It could prolong the lifespan of someone who touched it by more than ten years. Then, Zagru put his hands in front of his chest and hoped the benevolent Buddha would lend him his blessings because the ink Keelan was a forecloud, which was the most powerful one. Enlightenment was a powerful process. The Enlightener was always greatly impacted in the end and was under extreme pressure during the process. Zagru's face turned pale and weak with sweat dripping on his robe, whereas in moments, the ink keelan on Yue's chest started to enlighten with a brighter glow, and Yue's face became more peaceful. Yue was having a dream where he was surrounded with four spheres of light, including red, purple, green, and blue. His dream ended, and he woke up when the spheres of light faded. When he was back up, he thought he would have become Superman by then, but he felt no difference. In excitement, he tried to punch the ground with the full force of his hand, but his hand turned red and started hurting. He started to think Zagru had lied to him, and there was no effect on him. His strength seemed to have no difference. Then when he got up, he felt a lot of flexibility in his body. He was feeling better than ever. He went to look out for Zagru to ask him about this, but Zagru came through the door to him. 
He was surprised Yue woke up early, and when Yue asked him how much he had slept, Yue was starstruck. He had been sleeping for 36 whole days. But then Zegru told him it usually took 49 days for the whole process, and Yue had woken up early. Zagru spent nine days awakening the bloodline, and then the rest 27 days were for the bloodline to merge with Yue's body. The awakening process went smoothly overall, and Yue was the first four-cloud ink kill in in history. Then he took Yue outside to explain to him the whole process and other things about the patron saints. The power level of patron saints was measured by clouds. There were nine cloud levels. Each cloud level was stronger than the previous one by 1.5 times, except the last three cloud levels, which were two times stronger than their previous levels. Yue was a four-cloud Keelin, but he had to train from the beginning to gain strength. He was not as strong as he thought he was, and without training he was just at normal strength. There were four types of Keelin, thunder, fire, wind, and water, and each of them had their own cloud color with special abilities. Yue had each of these colors, so he had the abilities of all the types of Keelin, and he was the first person to ever possess that kind of power. Yue had the potential to become the strongest person ever among the Guardians of the East. He was the greatest genius in the history of Kilin, and the most gifted Kilin ever. Yue was eager to gain all that power, but he had to start training first. The training process for him was called the Soaring Kilin Technique, but it required immense effort. To increase a cloud level, he had to advance all four types of cloud levels together by keeping a balance, so it was a hard process. But his strength level would advance by two times for each level, so he had an advantage as well. If Yue reached the Nine Cloud level, he could become invincible. However, there had only been one Nine Cloud level patron saint in history. Zagru's mission had been completed then because he was only there to awaken the Ink Keelin, but he and Yue were destined to be comrades forever because they were the Keelin and the Divine Guide. He told Yue that every patron saint needed to find the secrets of his abilities himself. Practice and experimenting were the key to training, and believing in oneself was the most important thing. Yue was then instructed to leave that place soon and return to the city he was most familiar with, as that was his best training ground. Before leaving, Zagru told Yue a story. There was once a man who married four wives, and the fourth wife was the one that he was closest to. He took her everywhere he went. She was the apple of his eye, and he took immense care of her. He provided her with any food or clothes she demanded. His third wife was also loved by him because he went through many troubles to get her. So, he sent sweet words to her every day and built a beautiful house for her to live in. His second wife was his soulmate and companion, and he felt the most comfortable around her. Whenever he was upset, he would come to her to talk. However, his first wife was living a miserable life. She handled all the heavy family work and responsibilities, but he never paid a visit to her. He never gave her any attention. One day, the man asked his wives if they wanted to go with him to a faraway place and never come back. The fourth wife instantly rejected the offer, and on hearing that, the third wife also disagreed with him. The second wife was also not ready so she just agreed to walk with him to the city gate. When he was rejected by all three of them, he remembered he had a first wife. When he asked her, she accepted his offer and was ready to go with him wherever he went. This made him realize that his first wife was the one who would never leave him alone, and the place where the man was going was the world of death. In that story, the fourth wife represented the body of a person and how a person loved his own body, but after death, it would be of no use. The third wife represented wealth, and it would be of no use either. The second wife represented the close ones, and they would only help bury you and eventually forget about you. The first wife was the spirit of a person. Spirit never would ever leave wherever you go, even after death. After hearing all this, Yue was inspired. He was ready to train himself and not regret anything. Then, Zagru instructed a trainer to stay with Yue and accompany him. She was a charming woman, and as soon as Yue saw her, he was flabbergasted. Yue was a big admirer of girls. He had nine levels of categories for women. The horror level was the lowest, which meant that he would pass out as soon as he saw them. Then the dinosaur level would make him run away from them without passing out. The scare level meant that Yue would keep his eyes on himself to let them know he wasn't interested in them. Attention level beings were ordinary looking women. Then, the eye candy, covet, and urge levels were the real deal. Those were the beautiful and charming women. The topmost level was the admire level, and when he got to know Shui, he had classified her as admire level. When Zagru introduced Ji Ming Ming, one of the three patron saints, to Yue, he was very excited. Ming Ming was tasked with helping Yue in training, but Yue had other plans. He told her he was 19 and single to let her know he was interested in her. He even allowed her to punish him in training if he slacked off. Yue asked her if he could call her Little Chicken, which made her angry already. After some chatting, Zagru asked Yue to leave Ming Ming and him alone for a while, as he wanted to discuss something private with her. Ming Ming instantly jumped to the question if Yue really was a Qilin and the Zodiac King, because by his attitude, he did not look like one. A Qilin should have charisma and extreme capabilities to lead all of the patron saints, 
which Ye clearly lacked. Zagru also had the same thoughts, but he knew that Ye was kind-hearted on the inside. So Zagru told her to ensure Yue's safety in any way, because Yue was the only one who could attract all the patron saints towards himself. But for Yue to even reach one cloud level was almost impossible, because he was a four-cloud Qilin. So Ming Ming needed to encourage him and help him train to his fullest and keep his identity hidden. Zagru instructed them both to contact Dragon as soon as they reached Jing City, because he was the most outstanding patron saint. Before leaving, Zagru had arranged for them a ride to the train station. Upon hearing that, Yue became very excited because he remembered that Zagru had a Lincoln Navigator. Zagru became a bit emotional and wished for the best for Yue because he had a tough life ahead as the Zodiac patron saint. Then they both bid farewell to Zagru and left the temple. On their journey to the train station, Yue was fully laid back in the back seats of the Lincoln Navigator and was enjoying his time with a cigarette in his mouth. Ming Ming was very disappointed on seeing Yue's childish attitude and his cigarette. Yue had an ideology that if a man did not smoke, his life was worse than a dog's. He did not care about tobacco or any other poisons. His main reason for smoking was the hardships men face daily, the pressure of providing income to their family and working hard for a stable life. He also mocked women by saying that men don't cry like women. For men to get rid of all that pressure, smoking and drinking were the only ways according to him. Ming Ming was furious by hearing all that misogynistic talk, but the driver agreed and even asked Yue for a cigarette. Yue then asked the driver about the expensive cars at the Holy Buddha Temple, but he was then told that all the cars were donated by the government. Master Zagru always donated all the tourist income generated to the charity. Zagru had an extremely simple lifestyle which all the people admired. A little bit of time passed, and Yue asked Ming Ming how she was going to Jing City. After hearing that she wanted to go by plane, he was surprised. He insisted on going by train because it was cheaper. But when Ming Ming told him that the people of the Holy Buddha Temple were free to take any flight at any time, his views changed. He was instantly ready to board an airplane and experience the high blue skies. In excitement, he clapped his hands. As soon as he did that, his right hand caught fire. He became afraid and quickly put the fire out by rubbing his hand. When he asked Ming Ming what happened to his hand, she did not tell him, and dodged the question when they were still in the car. When they reached Tibet Airport, Yue asked her again what happened back there. She told him that it was an ability of his four-cloud Qilin. When his hand caught fire, it was the fire Qilin's ability. But since Yue wasn't trained, his power was very weak and there was only a small fire. The strange thing was that he did not feel any heat on his hand because it was his own Qilin flame. However, Ming Ming strictly told him not to use his abilities in front of ordinary people to prevent any unnecessary trouble and to keep their identities hidden. Yue was still amazed, because it was the first time that he saw his superpower in action. Then they both sat in the VIP waiting area of Tibet Airport. Yue was a bit bored, but he had a beautiful woman sitting beside him. Ming Ming was 18 years old and lived in Jing City too, and upon hearing that, Yue became even more interested in her. Then Yue asked for her phone as his phone was dead. He took the phone from her soft hands and dialed Vol. When Vol told Yue that Yan Xiaoyi formed a big group and was looking for Yue to take revenge, he became a bit concerned. Vol had also changed schools because of that, so it was hard for them to meet up like before. Yue ended the call and gave the phone back to Ming Ming. Then soon, a flight attendant from the airline company came and led them to their airplane seats. They were VIP seats, so Yue was quite happy. When the plane was about to take off, Yue was still sitting in his seat sideways like a kid and had no seatbelt on. Then his seat started shaking and he became afraid that the plane might fall. Yue was scared of heights. As soon as Ming Ming saw that Yue was shivering from fear, she came and sat by his side and started mocking him because he was being a manly dude back in the car. She started to make fun of his fear of heights, but out of the blue, Yue jumped on Ming Ming and hugged her tight because he was very afraid in the plane. Ming Ming was confused as to what happened right there. Ming Ming's soaring cloud technique was at three cloud level, but had reached a bottleneck. It was very difficult to break from that bottleneck alone, and external help was needed. But right then, Ming Ming felt a burning sensation in her body. Her soaring cloud technique was in a boiling state. Physical contact with Yue's ink Qilin was potentially helping her break through the bottleneck, so she did not push him back. Yue was even happier, so he fell asleep in her arms. After two hours, they arrived at the Jing City Airport. Yue was still in the same position, asleep in Ming Ming's arms. She woke him up and told him that they were about to land. After landing, Yue started blushing and thanked Ming Ming for her support and not pushing him back, but she dodged by saying it was her mission. They decided to spend the first night at Yue's place, because Ming Ming had to teach him the soaring killin' technique as soon as possible. She told him one night was enough for it. On the other hand, Yue became very excited as they were going to spend time together at his place. On the way to his place, Ming Ming sat in the back seat with him because she found out that if she was within a meter from Yue, 
It helped her soaring cloud technique. She could break the bottleneck. When Ming Ming asked about Yue's parents, she became genuinely sad upon hearing that he was an orphan. He did not know who or where his parents were. But Yue was used to it, and he kind of liked it because he had complete freedom over anything. Yue knew that he and Ming Ming were completely different beings from different backgrounds and could not link up without the help of Zagru. Then, Ming Ming asked him a question. She asked if they were friends, to which he replied yes, because she helped him in the airplane when he needed help. She did not push him back even though she did not like it. They both shook hands and were happy to have each other. Yue sighed because he could not tease her anymore as they were friends now. Ming Ming called him a loser and a perv, which he took as a compliment. On their way to Yue's place, Ming Ming told him that Master Zagru suggested both to attend college so that they can enrich their knowledge. Yue was not at all in agreement with that because he hadn't even completed middle school properly. But when Yue gave it a thought, he realized that colleges were full of beautiful girls, so it could be a really nice opportunity for him to get along with pretty girls. When they reached Yue's apartment and Ming Ming saw the terrible and dirty place he was living in, her hopes died down. Yue only had one room and one bed, so he vowed to her that he wouldn't do anything inappropriate to her because she was a friend. On the way to his room, they met an old man named Li, who seemed like a friend of Yue. He asked Yue where he had been all that time, and that everyone missed him. When old Li saw Ji Ming Ming with Yue, he became amazed by her beauty, and because Ji also meant hooker in Chinese, he thought she was a girl from a brothel. He told Yue to introduce her to himself after he was done with her. When Ming Ming heard all that, she was so furious that she was about to kill the guy, but Yue stopped her and said that he was a kind guy. After this encounter, Ming Ming hoped to never visit Yue's place again. When they both entered Yue's room, it was like a dog's nest. Bottles were scattered around the dirty floor. The furniture was old. She questioned him if he was the patron saint of Qilin or a dog. But when Yue told her about his 600 yuan per month allowance from the government and his expenses, she became a bit sympathetic. She told him that he would move out of that place with her tomorrow because his living condition was terrible. Yue was ready to move out of his terrible room but on one condition. He wasn't going to take any money from Ming Ming or any type of help. He wanted to live on his own and not by the help of a woman. Soon after that, Ming Ming was ready to teach Yue that soaring Qilin technique, but before that she warned him that he had to work very hard to achieve something. On the other hand, Yue was already ready to work hard to fulfill his dream of wearing his underwear outwards like Superman. He was ready to begin with the soaring Qilin technique. Yue jumped down from the bed, and then they were ready to start the process. Ming Ming explained that the soaring Qilin technique wasn't hard to activate because Yue was a patron saint, and his potential was higher than normal people. He just needed to focus on developing his potential while cultivating. So constant cultivation was the best way to channel his strength and activate his technique. His abilities were also related to his zodiac sign. Ming Ming's zodiac sign was a rooster, so her abilities were those of a rooster, like beak, wings, claws, and voice. Yue was a Keelan, so his abilities were mostly balanced and not specific. He was the jack of all trades. He did not have any specific strength nor any weakness. Back in the day when humans inherited Chilin's bloodline, they used the mantra method to use Chilin's abilities. There were nine characters in the mantra, Lin, Bing, Dao, Zhe, Jie, Zhen, Li, Qian, and Xing. It was the same case with Yue. He had to use the mantra method to activate his abilities. Yue tried the method by saying Lin, and his hand instantly caught fire. This was the default mantra all Qilin's could use to summon fire. Yue was excited that he would not need to buy a lighter anymore and lit up his cigarette using his hand, which made Ming Ming very angry. She shouted at him to stop right then. Yue thought that if he used his technique a few times to light cigarettes, it might get stronger. Then, Ming Ming gave Yue a picture of eight main meridians to memorize. That was his first task. While Yue was tasked with memorizing the acupoints of meridians, Ming Ming put her own bedsheet and blanket on the bed and went to sleep there. But after every half an hour, she used to wake up Yue and ask him about a random acupoint by hitting him on his body. He had a weak memory ever since his childhood, so it was hard for him to memorize all that stuff. Under Ming Ming's strictness, it took him the whole night to memorize all the acupoints of Yingqiao Meridian. It was morning when he was finally done with all the memorizing, and Ming Ming was still strict. She was ready to leave the place and thought Yue wouldn't be sleepy because he had the Qilin super regeneration. Yue gave up in front of Ming Ming's strictness and packed his bags. They both left his place, but Yue was still very sleepy and impatient to sleep at their new place. Yue was already tired of Ming Ming's strictness and wanted her to leave him alone, but she reminded him again that becoming a patron saint wasn't easy at all. Yue also needed to focus on his physical fitness. His physical condition wasn't good because he smoked a lot. Yue tried to brag about his street fighting skills, but Ming Ming was not interested in that at all and called him a loser. Yue laughed, but soon he saw a group of guys coming towards him. 
He instantly knew who they were and told Ming Ming to leave that place. Those guys were there to take revenge from Yue and kill him, and Xiao Yi was one of those guys. Ming Ming was hesitant to leave because she did not know anything about those guys, but Yue insisted on her to leave because he did not want her to get hurt in his troubles. He valued her as a friend and wanted to protect her. Yue was curious as to how Xiao Yi found him, and he started chatting with Xiao Yi. When Yue found out that the old man Li in his building had snitched on him and told Xiao Yi about his whereabouts, he was not very disappointed because they weren't that close, and the man was threatened. After not finding a brick on the ground in that clean neighborhood, Yue just stood there and asked Xiao Yi to get it over with and do whatever he wanted. Xiao Yi was determined to take revenge and had a big red bat with him. All of Xiao Yi's boys started running towards Yue, and they all were instructed to beat up Yue without thinking about the consequences. But as soon as they reached near Yue, they all fell to the ground. It was the power of the legendary heavenly fortune that was protecting Yue. Upon seeing that, Xiao Yi became more pissed and took a run towards Yue with his bat. As he was just about to hit Yue, Ming Ming pulled Yue back and kicked Xiao Yi in the face. She wanted to be a heroine and she did show that by using her full power and knocking out Xiao Yi far away by just a kick. Ming Ming went into a full-on frenzy and kicked every guy in the group in their faces. She knocked all of them down, and it seemed like some of them were dead, but she assured Yue that she held back and only some bones were broken. Yue was in awe, and she had to remind him that protecting him was her duty, so she did all that for him. After seeing all that cool stuff Ming Ming did, Yue became mesmerized and inspired. He was then motivated more than ever to learn his soaring kill-in technique and be able to fight like her. He promised to memorize the acupoints of two meridians from that day onwards and work his hardest. Before leaving the scene, Yue went to Xiao Yi to mock him one last time and told him how weak he was. He made fun of him and let him rot after they both left the place. Yue thought Ming Ming was taking him to her place, but he was wrong. They were on the way to the most excellent and gifted patron saint of their generation, Dragon. She wanted to leave Yue in Dragon's hands because he was a trusted person to Master Zagru, and she wanted to prepare for college too. Dragon was the most powerful one among the 12 zodiac signs, and in terms of cultivation speed, he was even stronger than Kilin because he was the general of the patron saints, and Kilin was the commander of the patron saints. Dragon was only 23, and he had already reached 5 cloud level. That kind of power was unheard of in history because for most patron saints, the 5 cloud level was achieved by spending their whole lives training. Before arriving at Dragon's house, Ming Ming strictly advised Yue to act maturely in front of Dragon because he was a five cloud level patron saint, which was highly respected among the patron saints, and he was also an old fashioned person who did not like arrogant people. Soon they had arrived at the gate of Dragon's huge and graceful house. It was in the east of Jing City where all the rich people used to live. The walls were very high and it was filled with trees and greenery. There was also a swimming pool at the top of the house. Yue thought Dragon was paid a hefty amount because he was a patron saint, but it was actually his very own money which he earned through his hard work. It was not given to him by anyone. Yue was looking around and admiring the house with Ming Ming when a beautiful and graceful woman came to them. When he saw her, he became captivated. His heart started to race and he got lost in her beauty. She was the first person Yue instantly classified as perfect, but when Ming Ming called her sister Dragon, Yue became even more enthralled. He could not believe she was the one Ming Ming was talking about. She was a dragon. Dragon advised Ming Ming to not call her that name and to call her by her real name, Hai Ruyu, or Sister Ruyu. Ruyu recognized Ye because Zegru had told her about the new Qilin. She then invited them both to the inside of the house. Yue was still standing outside lost in Ruyu's beauty, so Ming Ming had to pinch him and pull him inside. She warned him not to think inappropriately about Ruyu because there was once a guy who was interested in her, and then the guy had to lie in the hospital for three months. Ruyu was the CEO of a big company, and she was ruthless in that case. Then they both took a seat in front of Ruyu on soft white sofas. Ruyu had already made arrangements for Yue to live at her place, and for his and Ming Ming's new college. She offered Ming Ming to live with them, but she refused because she had been missing her home for quite some time. Then Ruyu started to summarize all of Yue's history to him and he became terrified about her knowledge. She even knew that Yue had fled Tibet some time ago because he assaulted the police bureau's director's son. When she called him a ruffian and a loser, he became a bit pissed at her because he was the king of Zodiac and not her. But then she offered him a deal that if he could beat her, she would obey all his commands. But until the time he couldn't beat her, he would obey her commands. By hearing this, Yue became humbled. Then Ru Yu arranged a ride for Ming Ming to go home while she took care of Yue. Before leaving Ru Yu's place, Ming Ming warned Yue one last time to not mess with Ru Yu if he wanted to live a stable and smooth life, but he told her that she should not worry about him. Then he went inside and sat with Ru Yu. She called her servant, Uncle Zhou, to prepare a room for Yue and some training clothes because she was ready to train him. 
Uncle Joe took Yue to his freshly prepared room, and by looking at how clean the room was, Yue was very surprised. He jumped on the comfortable bed and thanked Uncle Joe for the hospitality. Uncle Joe informed Yue that Ru Yue's huge mansion was called the Dragon Villa. In the Dragon Villa, three meals were served in the dining hall on the second floor, which were morning, noon, and evening meals. Every day from 7 to 8 in the morning, servants were allotted to clean Yue's room. When Uncle Joe told Yue that he was the first male guest at Dragon Villa, Yue asked him a strange question. He asked him if Ru Yu had a boyfriend, to which Uncle Joe couldn't reply, because he wasn't allowed to discuss Ru Yu's private life. Then Joe went to fetch a training suit for Yue and was back within moments. When he saw that Yue was sleeping on the bed, he politely asked him to wake up because they could not disobey Ru Yu's orders. She was very strict in that order. Yue agreed to wake up on the condition that he would not wear the training suit as he was more comfortable in his own suit. Then they both went towards the training room, and when they reached there, Uncle Joe left him at the door because he wasn't allowed to enter. Only the people Ru Yu selected were allowed to enter the training room with her. When Yue saw Ru Yu sitting on the ground posing like doing yoga, he started laughing. Then he told her that he wanted to go back to sleep. As soon as Ru Yu heard that, her eyes turned red, and she shouted at him to stop right there. Yue turned back and was about to leave through the door when he felt a hand with immense power throw him back into the training room. It was Ru Yu's hand and she casually picked him up and threw him to the other side of the room. She ordered Yue to never go against her words again because she did not care if he was a Keelan or a loser. She treated everyone the same. After hearing that, Yue decided that he wanted to leave the Dragon Villa, as he could not live under someone's strict command. But Ru Yu wasn't ready to let him go. She made him a similar offer again. If Yue could beat Ru Yu in combat, he could leave the place. But if not, then he had to stay. Upon hearing that, Yue knew he couldn't beat her in full-on combat, but he had a plan. If he held her from her thighs and pinned her under his body, she would get extremely humiliated. And that would be a win for Yue. When Yue tried to execute his plan, he miserably failed. Ruyu kicked him in the face, and he fell back far away on the other side of the room. Ruyu told him that he could pay her back once he was stronger than her, but at that time he was not, and he had to obey her. Then, Ruyu told him about the Ink Killin's superhuman regeneration ability, and the drawback of that in combat. Since Ink Killins were weak because of their regeneration ability, they were always targeted first in combat. So, to be less of a burden for other patron saints, Yue had to develop and perfect his regeneration ability first. To support the patron saints as the king of Zodiac, he had to go through the toughest training possible. He was not strong enough at that time to earn the patron saint's respect, but Ruyu was determined to make him the strongest among them. She wanted to perfect his regeneration ability and make him impossible to kill. All that was only possible if Yue went through pain. So she kept attacking him like she was torturing him. His face became covered in blood, and it was then he realized that Ru Yu really was a terrifying being. Ming Ming and Uncle Joe weren't wrong about her powers. After one long hour of torture, Ru Yu stopped and told Yue that each training session was held with a three-day gap, and the time was increased by ten minutes for the next session. For the whole hour, Yue did not say a single thing to Ru Yu to stop the torture, which showed that he was a gentleman and a dedicated Keelin. He was okay with her hitting his body because he knew she could never destroy his spirit, but his ego was hurt. He did not like being hit by a beautiful woman, so he made a surprising promise to her. With full confidence, he said he will make a prostitute out of her one day. When she heard that, she became very vexed and was about to do something. But Uncle Joe came through the door and so she let Yue go, but specifically told Joe to not treat his wounds. Yue was only allowed food and water. Yue's wounds were mostly external injuries, and his bones were fine, so he would recover easily. This showed that Dragon was actually a smart patron saint, and she knew what she was doing. However, Uncle Joe warned Yue to not get on her bad side again, because she would have an even more forceful demeanor the next time. Yue was shaken by her torture, and he knew not to mess with her again. Ruyu was destined to polish Yue's cultivation technique, but for that, he needed to have a tough body. So she had to torture him and give him the toughest treatment possible. But there was a strange fluctuation in her cloud power whenever she grabbed his body. Yue's body strongly repelled her cloud power. It was because of the Kilin's powers of heavenly fortune. While Yue was asleep in his room, there were black and silver currents surging around his body. These currents were responsible for the regeneration of his body. He was having dreams of the acupoints of meridians, and even those ones which he hadn't learned yet. That was the effect of the Kilin's bloodline. It was finally awakened for the first time, and it seemed like the four-cloud ink Kilin was not actually useless after all. Some time passed, and then Ruyu went to check up on Yue. When she went near him, she felt no resistance that time. The Keelan's aura had no effect on her cloud power then. That was because he was asleep and unconscious. When he was awake, Keelan's aura was also awake and working, but now the aura was sleeping as well. 
This made Ryu realize the true power of the King of Zodiac, even though he was just a weak and immature kid at that time. Suddenly, Yue started talking inappropriately in his dream about Ryu. As soon as she heard that, she became pissed at him for thinking so lowly of her. Then Uncle Joe came through the door and brought meat porridge for Yue. While having a chat with Ryu, Uncle Joe asked her if beating Yue was necessary, because he also thought he had a good heart and was kind. But Ryu wasn't in agreement with that, because she was angry about the inappropriate things Yue had been doing ever since he met her. According to her, it was necessary to beat him and teach him a lesson. On the other hand, Uncle Joe had a different view. He knew Ruyu was a beautiful 23-year-old woman with a great responsibility on her shoulder, but it was about time for her to find a partner. She also needed a shoulder to lean on, and finding a partner was the best way. If Ruyu kept torturing him every three days, Uncle Joe was afraid Yue might suffer traumas and hate her for the rest of his life. But nothing could be done because if Ruyu told Yue everything, all the training would be pointless. Torture and tough training was the only way to make him better at survival, even if he couldn't be as strong as her. Then Ruyu left the room, and soon after that Yue woke up. Uncle Joe was still with him, and the first thing he asked him was if he would be able to take the next torture. Yue had no choice, so he was stuck with taking it all up and withstanding it, and he knew she was not going to kill him ever. He was aware that he was a ruffian and would become a burden for the patron saints in the future, so all he could do was try to take the beating and get stronger. This way he could help the patron saints and not be a trouble for them. Uncle Joe also motivated him that if he worked hard, Ruyu would no longer look down on him. All he had to do was get stronger and work to his fullest potential. He knew that Yue was a true man at heart and that Ruyu wouldn't hurt him genuinely. Despite that, Yue needed a plan to absorb Ruyu's attacks in the next training session, so he asked Uncle Joe for help. Because Yue insisted, Uncle Joe agreed to help him. He taught him some basic tricks and tips for taking and absorbing attacks in combat, and also gave him a small book of basic cultivation methods. It was called The Tome of Zhuantian. When Zhou left, Yue was ready to start cultivation. A sphere of qi appeared in Yue's energy core after he was done cultivating a full circle. In moments, the sphere turned into red, green, blue, and purple colors. Yue knew these were based on Qilin's abilities of fire, wind, water, and thunder. He tried to harness the power and control of these spheres, and after some time he succeeded. He could summon specific spheres on his fingers by demand. When he said Lin, a fire sphere appeared just like before when Ming Ming taught him. After some time, the spheres vanished and he became confused, so he tried again. At that time, he cultivated 49 whole circles in a row and was about to channel the energy concentrated in his core. But Uncle Joe came through the door and saw him. He immediately stopped Yue from cultivating and warned him that without his guidance, if something went wrong, Yue could die. But Yue's energy was very high and his wounds weren't hurting anymore. With a snap of his finger, he instantly spawned the four spheres of Qilin's abilities on his fingers. When Uncle Joe saw that, his eyes froze and he started sweating. He had taught Yue cultivation with his own method, but Yue already had abilities in the first place. This could potentially ruin Ruyu's plan of teaching Yue the technique. He rushed outside the door to call Ruyu and tell her what had happened. Ruyu came to his room and asked him to show her the abilities again. When she saw the four spheres, she was amazed too. Ruyu told Uncle Joe to leave them both, and then took Yue to the training room again. She had underestimated Yue's powers. It had only been two days, and Yue thought she was going to torture him again. But she had other plans. She was going to demonstrate the true abilities of patron saints to Yue. Yue was ready to observe. When Ruyu was ready to show off her zodiac sign dragon's true abilities, she instructed Yue to watch closely. A beam of bright light flashed everywhere, and Yue's eyes turned blind. After the bright light died down, he saw Ruyu's clothes lying down on the floor. When he looked at her in excitement, he saw that her dress was completely changed. She was wearing a beautiful purple robe with sharp horns hovering on her shoulders and her long blue hair hanging down beautifully. She then told him to come closer, and as soon as he came a bit closer, he was pushed back by a magical force, and he fell far away on the ground. Yue thought she did that on purpose to torture him, but then he found out that it was actually Dragon's true power. Ruyu told him that at 3 cloud level, Dragon had the Zodiac transformation ability, and at 6 cloud level, that ability would reach the second stage. She could easily have been able to burn down that villa to ashes, and no weapon would be able to hurt her. The dragon's power was extremely vast, and a normal person would have already passed out, but Yue's Kilin regeneration ability was helping him. He was unaffected by the dragon's power. After that, Ruyu had a mission to do, and since Yue was a patron saint, she wanted to show him what the patron saint missions looked like. So, she decided to take him along with her too. In the blink of an eye, she grabbed Yue and started flying in thin air. Yue did not even have time to process what just happened. 
He was flying in the air above the clouds like an airplane, and it scared him to death because he was afraid of heights. They were flying in moonlight like a bird. When Ru Yu came to know that Yue was afraid of heights, she became excited because the next time he did not obey him, she would have something to mock him on. She could also threaten to take him on a flight if he did not follow her orders. When she told Yue that he could also fly when he reached the first stage of Zodiac Transformation, he became more a bit eased. Everyone wished to fly and so did he. Ru Yu told him where they were actually going. Many beasts of the ancient times had gone extinct because they couldn't adapt to the changes in the environment, but many beasts still remained. The ones with the greatest resilience and resistance had survived. Most of them were hidden in mountains and oceans and were terrifying. They were extremely powerful. These beasts were usually dormant and did not mess with humans, but if they woke up from their cultivation, they would bring chaos to human society. However, they were small in numbers, and they did not have the ability to reproduce, so they were easy to deal with. This was how the patron saints helped the East. Yue then asked about the Order of the West. The West had two groups of guardian forces. The first one was the force of the Holy See, and they used to cultivate the power passed down to them. This power could be used to destroy ancient beasts. The other group were the successors of Greek mythology. In each generation, an honorable and talented person would appear along with his followers. He would protect the West with his force. The Greek mythology successor of the last generation was Apollo, and he protected the West with the Twelve Warriors of the Sun. Ruyu was sure that the Greek mythology successor of their generation had appeared as well, because the Ink Keelan had also appeared in the shape of Yue. Yue and that Greek successor were always destined to be rivals. They had fought since ancient times, and both parties suffered losses. However, the East had an upper hand usually. However, the Greek mythology successor was always blessed with extraordinary powers ever since they were born, so they had an upper hand against the Keelan. Keelan needed extreme cultivation in order to reach its full potential, so... Yue had the potential to surpass Ru Yue in power, but he needed rough and tough training to achieve that. Ru Yue agreed to teach him the Soaring Keelin technique when they returned home. But for the time being, they had reached their destination of mission, and since Yue was afraid of heights, it was quite a rough landing for him. They went into a mysterious cave in the basement of the mountain, and Yue was a bit skeptical about it. When Ru Yue saw the beast, she froze right there. The beast was a Sieji-type beast, and it was huge, with long wings and a black body. Ruyu knew the beast was more powerful than her, and she feared it might come into contact with Yue. When the beast tried to attack Yue, she hit him on the horn with her special ability attack, a mysterious yellow arrow, but the beast was totally unaffected. She then knew that if they kept fighting like that, Yue and her both would die. She quickly ordered Yue to split up and run, so that at least one of them would have a chance of surviving. Ruyu ran with flashing speed whereas Yue was left behind. He thought she had abandoned him to save her own life, so he started running too. But in a moment when he looked back, he saw her fighting the beast behind him. She had made it her mission to protect Yue at all costs, even if she lost her own life. This hurt Yue's ego because he was being protected by a girl, so he also picked up a brick and started running towards the beast. Ruyu tried to stop him, but it was too late. He ran with light speed and attacked the beast with the brick. He hit the beast on his horn to have maximum impact. Yue's eyes were flashing bright, and his Killin tattoo appeared on his body. It seemed like he was a totally different person then. It seemed like the King of Killeen had awakened at that time. When the three, zero, zero, zero year old beast saw that a weak person like Yue had hit him that hard, he became very frustrated and pissed at him. He did not care if Yue was the Ink Keelin or the King of Zodiac, he just wanted revenge at that time. But when the beast jumped at Yue to attack him, he froze midair and realized who Yue actually was. He instantly stopped right there and sat down to apologize to Yue. The beast knew Yue was the king of Keelin, and since ancient times, Zieji type beasts had been servants of Keelin. He told the king of Keelin that he was unaware the Keelin bloodline had awakened, and that he was very sorry for his bad behavior. Upon hearing that and seeing the huge beast become so polite and humble in front of him, the king of Keelin offered him to become his successor's shadow. This meant that the beast would evolve to a higher state than he was at then, but only when Yue truly became the king of Keelin. That would take quite some time, so until then, the beast had to fall into a slumber. Then, the king of Kilin instructed Ruyu to protect Yue at all costs, as she was the successor of the dragon. Dragon was also like Sieji, and Kilin had a strong attraction and effect on dragon as well. So depending on Ruyu's behavior, she had to bear how the king of Kilin, Yue, treated her in the future. Then, before leaving back to the Kilin clan, the king of Kilin declared Sieji as his successor's shadow and flew into the air like a prodigy. He also told Ruyu to let Yue cultivate and learn his abilities on his own. There was no need for her to teach him, because the king of Keelin wanted him to learn on his own. In moments, the body of Yue fell into Ruyu's hands as if it was lifeless. She was very confused, and did not understand anything the king of Keelin had said, or anything about Sieji.
But one thing had changed. Her opinion about Yue drastically changed because of the fact that Yue ran back to save her life from the beast and the appearance of the King of Keelin. When they returned to Dragon Villa, Yue fell into a deep coma which lasted for almost a hundred full days, and once that was over, Ruyu taught him the Soaring Keelin technique. Quite some time passed after that, and it was almost mid-October in Jing City. It was finally time for Ming Ming and Yue to attend university, and Ruyu chose Singbei University for both of them. It was one of the most well-known and prestigious universities in the country. When Ruyu dropped off Yue at the university on his first day, she was worried about the fact that Yue was more interested in finding beautiful girls at the university rather than gaining knowledge. Yue's only goal there was to look at gorgeous women like a bad guy. As soon as Yue entered the university through the gate, he started looking at girls in hopes of finding a cute girl. He mostly found nerdy girls which he wasn't interested in, but after some time, his eyes froze when he saw a really beautiful and sophisticated girl coming at him. His heart was fluttering, and so he tried to start a conversation with her. He tried to play innocent by admiring the beauty of the university and not knowing that the girl was coming towards him. This way the girl kept coming and bumped into him and her books fell to the floor. He apologized to her that he was so captivated by the beauty of the campus that he did not see her. Yue asked her the location of the student affairs office, but she told her that the enrollment period was over and that he was late. That did not worry Yue because Ryue was a respected person in Jing City and she was very rich, so she had handled that problem with money. Then, to make her more interested in him, Yue offered her a treat as an apology for him bumping into her. But she was smart. She saw right through his tricks and knew his true intentions. She immediately left and advised him to focus more on his studies. After that disappointment, he was on his way to the student affairs office in room 103 on the first floor of the campus building. Yue was very good at studies ever since he was a child, but he had to drop out from school because he was an orphan. After that, he lost his interest in studies, and it meant nothing to him. When Ryu got to know that Yue picked the philosophy major, the least promising one at the university, she became so mad at him that she instantly called him while he was on the way to the office and ranted to him about the troubles she had to go through for all that. Yue did not pay any attention to Ruyu's talk and then headed straight to the dormitory. It was a room of four, and upon finding that, Yue wasn't happy that he would have to live with three other men. While he was outside the room, he suddenly heard strange female voices coming from the room. When he entered the room, Yue found out that he was going to share a dorm room with three women, not men. He was extremely excited as soon as he got into the room. He stared at two of the girls. They instantly stopped and started shouting at him, and one of them was even about to hit him with a bat, but the other girl stopped her and wanted to listen to what Yue had to say about the situation. Right at that moment, Ming Ming entered the dorm room and saw the fuss Yue had created. The two girls were Ming Ming's friends, and they thought that Yue was her boyfriend and she had let him enter the room. Ru Yu had convinced the university to let Yue live together with Ming Ming in a girl's dorm room, but the problem was convincing the other two girls. Ming Ming had a great plan to easily convince the girls. She secretly told them that Yue was her cousin, and that he was gay. Upon hearing that, the girls became a bit relaxed and felt sorry for Yue, they were quickly convinced and allowed Yue to live with them. Yue started jumping around the room because it was like a dream come true for him. His mind couldn't process the thought that he was about to live with three girls in a room. But when Ming Ming told Yue to not be excited as he was gay, he stopped right there with confusion. Yue called Ming Ming into the other room for a private talk. He asked Ming Ming about what was happening and she told him everything. Yue had two choices then, to admit he was gay or to tell them he was straight, but then he would have to live in the boys' dormitory. Since it was Yue's dream to live together with girls, he chose to admit he was gay so he could live there. At the end of the day, Yue had fully moved into the dorm with those girls and brought his essentials with him. Then, he went outside to get some fresh air. He was pissed at the fact that Ming Ming had to be with him at all times because Ru Yu had tasked her with always keeping Yue safe. In the park outside the dormitory, he saw Yan Xiaoyi once again. Since Xiao Yi's dad was the police bureau's chief and Xiao Yi was good at computer science, he was pretty popular at the university. When Ming Ming saw the look on Yue's face, she thought that Yue was jealous of Xiao Yi being with cute girls. But deep down, Yue was totally okay because he knew that he was with the cutest girl on the campus, Ming Ming. They both left university to roam outside for a while. Yue saw a boy with a big build sitting on the corner of the street at the barbecue shop. When he went closer, he found out that it was Vol, his long-lost junior. Vol was like a brother to Yue, and he was very happy to finally meet him again. Vol was also very delighted when he saw Yue, and he opened two bottles for both of them to drink as a welcome back party. They both sat there and drank together and had wide smiles on their faces, as if they had found their long-lost comrade. Ming Ming also sat with them and enjoyed their wholesome reunion. It was a really good party before they saw Xiao Yi coming at them again. 
He was with a very beautiful girl, and those two approached their table. When Vol recognized the girl with Xiao Yi, he started blushing. It was his high school teacher whom he had a crush on. He was flushed and started getting uncomfortable. The girl approached Yue and wanted to have a talk with him in a private place. She instructed Tian Bo Guang, which was Vol's real name, to go back to school. But when she found out Vol was also involved in beating up Xiao Yi, she called him with them too. Ming Ming followed them too, because she was tasked with keeping an eye at Yue at all times. When all of them reached a quiet place which had no humans in the vicinity, the girl stopped. She knew that Ming Ming was the one who knocked out several people of Xiao Yi's group with just her kicks, so she made an offer to her. If Ming Ming lost to her in a fight, the girl would make Yue pay for what he had done to Xiao Yi. Since the girl insisted on fighting, without any second thoughts, the fight started. The girl was Mo Di, the world champion of karate. Dai tried to kick Ming Ming in the stomach, but she blocked her kick quite easily. On her next kick, she targeted Ming Ming's head, but Ming Ming dodged, and her kick hit a tree. The kick was so strong that the tree broke into two pieces. Vol became concerned that Ming Ming might lose because his teacher was the world champion of karate, but Yue had confidence in her. Since Xiao Yi was standing beside them watching the fight, Yue offered to have a fight with him. Last time Yue had a brick, but this time he brought a bottle to the fight. Xiao Yi was prepared to dodge his bottle and then close in the distance for his martial arts to be effective. When he dodged the first bottle, he was about to run towards Yue, but another bottle came through the air and hit him in the face. He was unaware that Yue had brought two bottles to the fight. Xiao Yi fell to the ground and cried about Yue bringing two bottles to the fight, but he was surprised when he saw Yue's jacket filled with two more bottles and two bricks. Yue was standing on top of Xiao Yi and mocking him when a kick with flashing speed came towards his stomach. It was Dai's kick which could break trees in half. Yue instantly used his Qilin abilities to repel the kick and saved himself. He knew that if he got hit, he could die right there. Ming Ming offered to stop the fight because Dai was going to lose if it continued, but Dai was not going to stop. She was pissed because Yue had done so much damage to her uncle's son, Xiao Yi. Two horns had grown on Xiao Yi's head, and they were connected to his cranial nerves, so they couldn't be removed by surgery either. Vol made fun of Xiao Yi's head, but when Ming Ming saw that, she instantly realized something. She knew that the horns were the effect of the zodiac transformation of the zodiac sign of goat, and Dai's kick was the trait of the zodiac sign of rabbit. Right there, they had just discovered two patron saints born into one family, which was very rare. It was very hard for both of them to believe Ming Ming, so to make them believe her, Ming Ming demonstrated her zodiac transformation of rooster. She transformed into a beautiful girl with a pink dress and long hair strands and started floating. She told Dai that Yue was the only one who could fix Xiao Yi's horns because he was the leader of the patron saints and the Qilin king. Yue was not at all ready to help Xiao Yi because he was his longtime arch nemesis. He was ready to leave, but Di apologized on Xiao Yi's behalf and begged Yue to help him. When Yue saw the look in Dai's eyes, his heart melted. He asked them to look out for Vol in the university, and only then he would help Xiao Yi. They made the deal and Yue agreed to help him, but also warned him about the side effects of the process. If the process was conducted in a bad mood, it could have a variety of side effects on Xiao Yi. Since there was no other choice, Xiao Yi fixed his mood and was ready. But then he found out that for the process, Yue's mood mattered, and not his. Yue took advantage of this moment and asked Xiao Yi to call him his boss so that his mood would turn better. Yue also instructed him to not steal any women from him after that. He made Xiao Yi call him his boss two times, and then was ready to start the process. Yue tried to summon the protectors of the East, the twelve patron saints of the Zodiac, and asked them to show him their signs, but nothing happened. In confusion, he asked Ming Ming if he had done something wrong in the process. Although after a while, a giant rabbit appeared on Dai's head, and a giant goat appeared on Xiao Yi's head. This meant that the process had worked, and Xiao Yi's horns would disappear soon. Xiao Yi thanked Ming Ming, but when Yue heard that, he became angry at him for being interested in his friend. While he was shouting at Xiao Yi, a giant rabbit appeared on Vol's head too. Yue was an extremely lucky person, and he discovered three patron saints all at once at one place. Mo Di, Yan Xiao Yi, and Vol. Later, Vol and Di returned to their high school, and Yue went to his university with Ming Ming and Xiao Yi. When they reached there, a tall and handsome person dressed in black suddenly came to Ming Ming, and it seemed like he knew her. They both started chatting, and when Yue saw that, he was very jealous. He went towards the man in jealousy to talk to him because he thought the man was Ming Ming's boyfriend. When Yue met him and asked him why he was chatting with Ming Ming, he got to know that he was her big brother, Ji De. Yue had called him a jackass before, but then he became very polite and humble. The man was confused by Yue's behavior, but he offered to shake hands with him. Yue was very scared to shake hands with a guy that huge in size, because the guy could crush his hands if he was mad at Yue. But he wasn't.
Then the brother and sister went home, and they had to take Yue with them because Ming Ming was tasked with keeping him safe. Ming Ming's house was a big mansion comparable to Dragon Villa. Yue also found out that Ming Ming's father was the commander-in-chief of the army of Yanhuang Republic, General Ji Chang Ming. He was amazed by that information, but Ming Ming instructed him not to tell anyone because she did not want unnecessary attention. After some chatting, Dei took Yue with him apparently to show him his blade collection. But soon, Yue figured out that Dei was going to take revenge on Yue, calling him a jackass, because he took him to an empty room. Yue knew he couldn't kill him because Yue was the king of Qilin and had a regeneration ability, so he was ready to get beaten up. But when the first punch hit him, he realized the strength of the man. Dei was even stronger than Dragon in punches. Then Dei kicked Yue's face and he fell to the floor. After some beating, Dei told him that he had only used one-tenth of his strength that time, and was ready to use more if Yue created more trouble. Dei was going to leave the room, but out of jealousy, Yue cursed him and kicked him between the legs. Yue could do anything to get Ming Ming, and he was ready to fight a person so much stronger than him. But after a while, the fight resulted in Dei beating Yue so much that his face turned bloody. This hurt Yue's pride and ego, and as his last resort, he used his Qilin ability of Qilin Arm. Dei thought Yue was just acting, but Yue was unable to control the Qilin's power. The power rose to such a high level that Yue pushed Dei aside to not kill him and punched the wall. The punch created a huge hole in the wall, which Dei couldn't believe because the walls were supposed to be blast-proof. Upon hearing the noise from the punch, helicopters of the army started searching for the noise to ensure the Admiral House's safety. A secretary approached Dei to ask him what had happened, but Dei did not tell them about the punch to avoid any unnecessary reactions. On the other side of the room, Yue felt an unimaginable amount of power in his hands, and all his injuries were healed too. Then after dinner, Di drove both of them back to the university. After he dropped them off, he apologized to Yue by calling him master. He told him that he would recognize Yue as his master and obey him. On hearing all that, Yue and Ming Ming were confused and said goodbye to Dei and ran away in a hurry. On their way to the dorm room, Yue's mind was puzzled because he couldn't get over the fact that he left a huge dent on a nuclear-proof wall. What surprised him more was that Ji Dei was fighting at the level of Ruyu, which was a strange thing. When he reached the dorm, Yue started cultivating again, but there was a problem. All the cloud power in Yue's body had vanished and nothing was left. Yue became even more confused, but then suddenly in his mind, Sieji appeared. Sieji told Yue everything about becoming his shadow, and the Qilin's history and secrets. Sieji also taught Yue how to actually train for Qilin. Reproduction was a difficult process for Qilin, and so they would breed offspring with beasts back in time. Also, the main reason Qilin could command thousands of beasts was because of the ultimate Qilin's arm. After hearing all that, Yue started his cultivation technique. Yue's routine was totally different from others. He used to cultivate the whole night and sleep in the classroom during the day. One morning, Yue was asleep in the classroom, and so the teacher kicked him out. Yue was so talented that he could sleep while standing outside too. He was sleeping out in the corridor when a girl woke him up. It was the same girl he met when he first came to the campus. And then he found out that the girl was a teacher at the university, and she was one of the prettiest girls on the campus, like Ming Ming. Yue was very interested in all the women at the campus, and he thought life would go on like that smoothly. Later that day, Yue was in the dorm room with the three girls when suddenly the door started banging loudly. When one of the girls opened the door, it was Ji Dei. He was there to learn martial arts from Yue, but Yue had one condition to take Dei as his pupil. He wanted 3,000 yuan per month from Dei as the tuition fee. Dei instantly agreed and told him that he would be in contact with him at all times and asked him to start teaching him. Yue told him that his cultivation technique won't work for him because it was special for the king of Zodiac. So, Yue decided to take Dei to his own master. When Ming Ming heard that, she was confused. Yue even said that Ming Ming was the one who made Yue and his master meet. She did not know where Yue would take them, but both Ming Ming and Dei followed him. Soon, they ended up in front of the dragon villa, and Yue was there to meet Ruyu, which he called his master. Ruyu saw the three of them coming and became angry at Ming Ming for bringing a stranger into the dragon villa. But Yue told her that it was him who brought Dei, and he was there to learn martial arts. As soon as Dei met Ruyu, he offered her a fight, but she dodged the offer and ordered Uncle Joe to take Dei to the training room, while she took Yue and Ming Ming inside to discuss important matters. Inside, she scolded Ming Ming for bringing in the military into their affairs and not keeping Yue's identity hidden. Then Yue also had something to say to Ruyu. He asked her about a part-time job at one of her companies because his pride wouldn't let him live off a woman's money. He wanted a job that would offer two meals and some money for him to live. Ru Yu agreed to that. Then, Ru Yu gave them an important message. On January 10th of the following year, 
all the protectors of the East would gather on Tianxiang Mountain for an assembly meeting. In his childhood days, Yue used to live 30 km away from the Tianxiang Mountain, and so he thought it was just going to be a normal assembly on the mountain. But Ru Yu told him that the protectors of the East were gathering there to test them. They were going to make things difficult for the patron saints because they weren't strong enough yet. The protectors of the East were going to try to claim dominance over the patron saints. Yue was of the view that they should just let them win if it was a fight over status and fame. But when Ru Yu heard that, she was angry. She explained to Yue that without fame, the patron saints could not unite the East and lead them all. If the East wasn't united, there would be attacks from foreigners and chaos all around. In fact, the protectors of the East sensed that the Qilin had awakened, and since it was the weakest right then, they sent Ru Yu an invitation for the assembly on January 10th. Ming Ming advised Ru Yu that both her, Ru Yu, and Tiger could go to the assembly, leaving Yue behind because he was weak then. But the ancient Eastern families were so powerful that they could create trouble for the three of them. They had gained extreme levels of power, so in order to not appear afraid of them, they had to take Yue with them. The patron saints needed to work extra hard for the next three months to prepare for the assembly. They needed to showcase their powers, and especially the Zodiac King's powers. So Yue had to work very hard too. The Eastern families would not challenge them if all 12 patron saints were gathered together and were strong. By hearing all that, Yue decided to become so strong that everyone would admire him, or else his ego and pride would get hurt. However, Ruyu just wanted him to be able to keep himself alive, because she knew only that much could be done in three months. On the other hand, the three new patron saints would be taken by Mingming Ming and Ruyu to Master Zagru for training the next day. Yue did not want to go with them because he knew that any more training was pointless for him, and only so much could be done in three months. Then Ruyu got up and went towards the wall. When she pushed the wall, a secret door opened. It was the vault in which she kept the secret items Master Zagru had entrusted her with. Because things had gotten out of hand after the assembly invitation, she decided to give Yue some secret weapons to help him. She told Yue to pick any item of choice, and he could take it away if the item accepted him. There were three items, the Keelan Suit, the Keelan Orb, and the Keelan Ruby. There were originally eight items, but the Keelan of previous generations lost them due to their hardships. Ruyu explained the story of each of the items to Yue and their usage. The strange thing was that all three of them recognized Yue as their owner and accepted him. After that, Yue seemed to have changed a bit. Outside the villa, Ji Dae had totally accepted Uncle Joe as his grandmaster and was really excited to train with him. Soon, Dae, Yue, and Ming Ming went back to the university, and it was dark. Yue was in a pretty good mood when he and Ming Ming were walking in the university garden together, but she was a bit sad. When Yue found that out, he tried to talk her into being happy, and then jokingly, like an idiot, asked her if she was in love with him. Ming Ming would rather fall in love with a pig than Yue, and she was irritated by him after that. Then, Ming Ming asked him why he was not coming with them to meet Master Zhou the next day. Ming Ming thought something had changed about Yue. He wasn't acting like the ruffian he used to be back when they met. But Yue totally denied that and tried to prove he was still a loser by some inappropriate talks and a dirty joke about a man and a woman. He also wrote a small dirty poem about him and Ming Ming, and upon hearing that, Ming Ming was very irritated and kicked Yue into the lake beside them. However, a few seconds passed and Yue hadn't come up to the surface of the lake. Ming Ming became very scared and she thought Yue couldn't swim, so she went into the lake to find him and help him. Suddenly, Yue jumped out of the water and hugged Ming Ming and mocked her that she cared a lot about him. Both of their eyes were locked into each other's, and they were holding each other tight. In a moment, Ming Ming felt the freezing water and she got out of the water. After that encounter with Yue, she was blushing hard and her face was flushed. She felt a weird feeling she had never felt before. Yue only wanted to see what Ming Ming would do if he was in danger, and he was very happy with the results. He hugged her as a true friend who would help him at the cost of her own life, no matter what happened. Later, when he saw that she was soaked in water sitting outside the lake, he used his fire hand ability to make it warm for her and let her clothes dry. That night, Yue was wearing the Chilin Ruby necklace, which helped his firepower a lot. After that night, Yue did not feel inferior to Ming Ming anymore, and she did not seem out of his league then, but he was still not sure what relationship they both had. When they both returned to the dorm that night, Ming Ming quickly went into her room and slept right away, but Yue couldn't sleep. He couldn't get Ming Ming out of his head. He knew Ming Ming and the others were going to leave for the Buddha temple for the next three months, and he could only wish them a safe journey. He then called Vol and had a deep discussion with him. He told him that if he wanted to become stronger, he should work harder. If he wanted the woman he loved to love him back, he should work harder too. Yue knew the age gap between Miss Modi and Vol was significant, but if he worked hard, they both could work out. Vol's next three months at the Buddha temple could prove very beneficial to him if he worked to his fullest and trained hard. He could prove to Miss D that he had something different than the others, 
and was better at something. He needed to master the soaring cloud technique and become a worthy patron saint. This could be his way into getting Miss Dai interested in him. Then suddenly Vol told Yue to work hard too for Ming Ming. When Yue heard that, he flushed a little and then dodged the question by saying they were only friends. Vol knew his boss, so he knew that Ming Ming was admire level in Yue's eyes, and he really wanted her. It was quite late then, so then Yue told Vol to go to sleep because he was going to go to the Buddha temple the next day, and he needed rest. Yue thought about Ming Ming and his relationship for a while, and then went to start his cultivation. He felt a lot more powerful than ever before, and his technique was faster as well. When he woke up after his cultivation session, it was the next morning. He got up and saw that Ming Ming had left breakfast for him before leaving for Tibet. After a while, he got a phone call from Ruyu. Since Ming Ming was gone, she wanted someone else to look after Yue, because his safety was their top priority, and he couldn't be left alone. Ruyu wanted Yue to meet Tiger. Upon hearing that, Yue thought that Tiger was going to be a cute girl too, like Dragon. But when Ruyu took him to meet Tiger, he saw a tall, rich, and handsome brat standing in front of him. Yue's hopes were crushed, and to hide that, he told them that he did not expect Tiger to be a handsome boy, and instead he thought it would be an intimidating strong man. After hearing Tiger's classy talk and motto, they both got along well. It was like a perfect match between a spoiled brat and a ruffian. Tiger had identity issues in Jing City, and so Ruyu also settled that for him. He was going to be a finance teaching assistant after that, but his top priority was still to protect Yue at all costs. Before leaving, Ruyu mocked him for being a spoiled brat, to which he jokingly asked Ruyu if she was willing to marry him and join his harem of 50 girls. As expected, Ruyu became irritated and threatened to beat him up. When Ruyu left them, they both talked privately about how short-tempered she actually was, and that her future husband would hardly live a long life because of her temper. But Yue had one thing stuck in his mind because of his inappropriate nature. He asked Shu the tiger if he really had a harem of 50 girls, to which he replied that he just had 49 girls in his harem. Tiger was popularly called Yin Tiger, which meant lustful tiger. So Yue asked him for some tips to make girls interested in him. Tiger was happy to teach Yue his secrets, and he told him that if there is a chance, never miss it. To demonstrate his skills, he did a practical show. There was a pretty girl sitting on a table in front of them. Tiger went to her, sat down with her, had a small chat, and then came back before shaking hands with her. When he came back to Yue, he told him that he couldn't get her name, but he gave her his business card if she was interested. Yue was curious how Tiger had started the conversation with the girl. Tiger listed some excuses like asking for the time or making up a fake identity to start the conversation, but upon hearing that, Yue was not fascinated. Since Yue was a prideful person, to show off his skills, he made a bet with Tiger that if he could get the girl's name and number, Tiger would treat him to a fancy meal. Then, Yue approached the girl and sat down with her. When Tiger saw the conversation had started, he was amazed. He thought Yue was a legendary pickup master, and that appearance and charisma did not matter to him. But in reality, Yue was not at all on the level of Shu, and he only got lucky because the cute girl came out to be an acquaintance of Yue. She was actually Shui, the girl he met on the train ride to Tibet back then. After some chatting, Shui left the place with her father, who was one of the best medical scientists in the country. Shu was really impressed by Yue's skills because he thought the girl was just a random person, and Yue started the conversation from scratch. After that, they both returned to the university, where Xu Dong went to his office, and Yue to his dorm room. In the room, Xu Qing asked Yue where Ming Ming had gone, because he was with her last night, and they returned late. She was concerned about her, and thought Yue had done something bad. In the afternoon, Shen Yun, who was one of the two girls living with Yue, cooked him a very delicious meal, and he couldn't stop appreciating her. She asked him to not eat like a pig, and upon hearing the word pig, memories of the poem he wrote for Ming Ming started to appear in his mind. Then suddenly, Yun asked Yue if he had any classes later that day. When Yue heard that, he instantly realized that both the girls wanted some time alone and they might do inappropriate stuff. He became excited but had to leave for class because he couldn't just stay in the room with them. When the two girls were alone, they wondered if Yue had seen them the previous time, and he actually had seen them. On the other hand, Yue's class was quite boring for him, and so he just sat there thinking about his cultivation technique and other abilities, and how to perfect them. After two weeks of the same routine, Yue could feel the increase in his cloud power, and he also felt a change in his aura. He used to attend classes during the day and cultivate the whole night. After living with the two girls for some time, he got to know them more. Xu Qing was lively but a bit short-tempered, while Shen Yun was friendly, but she looked like she was hiding something all the time. Meanwhile, there stirred up a small trouble for Yue which bothered him a lot, all the girls in the university started chatting about the new hot teacher, Xu Dong. Yue was jealous of that, and he thought Xu was not there to protect him but to get more girls for his harem.
One fine day, Yue was in his room in his sleeping shorts when Ching entered the room and saw him half naked. She shouted at him and wondered why he was only wearing shorts. Then, after some mocking, Ching told Yue that the university was going to organize a field trip for the students soon. This could be their opportunity to leave their small dorm room for some days and go to a faraway place to enjoy. When Yue heard the word field trip, some bad memories flashed in his mind. When he was little, he once went on a field trip with his schoolmates. At lunchtime, all of them started showing off their expensive foods and items, while Yue only had a small potato and a bag of pickles in his pocket. This upset him a lot because he was an orphan, while the other kids had parents who would give them expensive things. In a moment, Yun came back from her class too, so they asked her where the field trip would be going, as she was in the thermodynamics department, and she knew insider information. When she told them that the trip was scheduled for Bay Hay that time, Ching became disappointed on hearing that. She had visited that place countless times already. Yue was still happy because he hadn't been to the seaside and beach before, so he was ready to have some fun. The girls were shocked upon hearing that he had never seen the sea before. The next day, the Tsingbei University field trip started, and Yue and the two girls sat in a bus with the other students. When everyone else saw that Yue was sitting with two beautiful girls, they became extremely jealous, whereas Yue was very happy. The bus ride was long, so Ming Ming had instructed the girls to take care of Yue, and they brought snacks for him. They were bored in the bus, so Ching asked Yue to play a game with them. The game was of rock, paper, scissors, but the loser had to answer a question asked by the other two, and no one was allowed to lie. Yue was really good at rock, paper, scissors because he was a ruffian, so Ching was at a big disadvantage. As expected, Yue won the best of three round and asked her a very daring question. He asked her who she loved the most, expecting her to say Yun's name, but she smartly answered with her mom's name. Then it was Yun's turn, and she lost too. He asked her who was her favorite male, to which she smartly replied with her dad's name. Yue was so frustrated with their answers that he did not want to play with them. However, the girls wanted to win and insisted on him to keep playing. Once again, Yue won the match against Ching, and this time he asked a really inappropriate question about her clothes and had to whisper it in her ears. Yue wasn't expecting her to reply, but surprisingly, she did. After that, Ching was not interested in playing more and was left blushing, whereas Yue was left happy in his imagination about the question he asked. Finally, the bus ride came to an end, and everyone got out of the bus. The three nearest hotels were fully booked by the university to house the students. The weather there was quite hot and humid like an Indian summer. Ching and Yun left Yue alone and went to join their other friends. Since Yue was new to the university, he did not have any friends, and nobody wanted to share a hotel room with him. He was alone in a room, but he was glad it came out that way because he could focus on his cultivation technique without any disturbance. After a while of cultivation, Yue got a call from Ching. She invited him to meet them after lunch because Yun insisted on it. They wanted to give Yue a chance to make up for the inappropriate talk that happened in the bus. Yue agreed to their offer and went to meet them after lunch at the beach. Yue was quite happy there because he got to see all the cute girls of the university there. And he even saw the beautiful teacher he met first when he joined the university. The two girls, however, were uncomfortable because the place was crowded. So the three of them went further away from the hotels, and finally there was a quiet place with no people in the vicinity. When they reached there, Ching offered Yue another bet because she wasn't happy with her defeat last time. The stakes were high that time because if Yue lost, he had to swim in the sea naked that night. However, if Ching lost, Yue could ask her to do anything but in moral bounds. Whoever reached the sea from the beach first would win the bet. Yue was still thinking about Ching's offer, but she quickly started her run towards the sea. Yue was not bothered at all, and he used his chillin' abilities by saying Lin. In the blink of an eye, he reached the sea before Ching could even make it to the half point. Ching was amazed by seeing that because she thought Yue was a heart patient and his heart was weak. At least that's what Ming Ming had told her so that she could have sympathy with Yue. Yue had clearly won the bet, so he was the one who would tell Ching what to do. Since he was a genuinely kind person from heart, he did not want to embarrass Ching with a humiliating dare, so he thought of a reasonable one. Yue had never been to the sea before, so he asked Ching to go swimming with him that night. He wanted to experience swimming at least once, and as a friend, he invited Ching. Ching initially disagreed, but when Yue mocked her for being scared of the dark, she had to agree with his bet because of her pride. When both of them came back to the beach, Yun could easily guess that Ching had lost the bet. Ching was so furious at Yue that she did not want to hang out anymore and wanted to go back to the hotel room. That's when Yue saw Tiger coming towards them with a pair of beautiful girls. The girls were twins, and they were gorgeous. Yue became jealous by seeing that. Tiger advised the Ching and Yun not to go too far off alone because they were alone, and it might be dangerous. 
Then he called Yue to have a chat with him privately. Tiger was greatly inspired by Yue when he saw that he was with two beautiful girls, and he was living in the girls' dormitory. But Yue was very jealous of Tiger and ranted about the girls Tiger was trying to flirt with and get. Tiger had a smart reply to that, and he told Yue he was just helping the girls get mature and learn about life. Then Tiger told Yue about a strange presence he felt at Sungbae University. Tiger knew there was some kind of mysterious danger at the university, but couldn't point out its exact location. Ming Ming couldn't feel the presence because she wasn't as sensitive to beasts as Tiger was. Tiger advised Yue to stay careful, and if any danger appeared, Yue could press the ruby on his bracelet to call Tiger. But for then, the presence was calm and did not appear to be malicious. After their small chat, Tiger left Yue with Ching and Yu and told him to keep trying to get close with the beautiful girls. Ching was of the view that Tiger was a great teacher, but Yue told her to keep away from him as he was a lustful man. Then, before leaving the place, Yun asked Yue if she could also join the two of them that night for swimming. The thought of two cute girls swimming with him made Yue so excited that he instantly said yes to Yun. The two of them went back to their rooms to prepare for the night and sort out their swimming suits. Finally, it was dark, and both of them were ready to swim with Yue in their new swimsuits. When they reached the beach outside their hotel rooms, they saw that it was very crowded. Many couples were out having a night swim. Ching wanted to go somewhere else, where there were no people that could see them, but Yue was scared. He thought there would be sharks if they went far away from the main beach. Upon hearing that, to tease Yue, Ching said that Yue was scared and that they had won the bet. Yue did not want to miss the chance of two cute girls swimming with him, so he accepted their way and went with them to search for a quiet place. They found a really beautiful place with a full moon shining above them and decided to swim there. Out of excitement, Yue let out a big scream which scared and irritated the other two girls. They jokingly told Yue to not scream again, or a pack of wolves would come and kidnap him. Then they were ready to enter the sea and start swimming. However, Ching saw the necklace that Yue was wearing and wanted to check it out. She thought it was a glass ball with a bulb that could change colors, but Yue knew it was the Qilin ruby. He did not want to show it to her, but she jumped on him and they both fell into the water. When they both got up, they were hugging each other in the water and had their eyes fixed onto each other. They both were blushing for a while. Ching quickly pushed him away and called him off for holding her. She was very furious at him and wanted to get revenge. She had a devious plan in mind. She started acting like she was about to drown in the deep water because of a fake cramp in her leg. Naturally, Yue quickly went to help her out, and when he held her hand, she jumped and took hold of his necklace. She felt a strong electric shock and let go instantly and asked Yue what that was, but Yue didn't know too. They both returned to the shore where Yun advised them not to play jokes like that again. They both were adults and needed to keep appropriate distance between themselves. Yun also told them to avoid physical contact because Ching was wearing a swimsuit and it was not appropriate at all. While she was giving this talk, a big green creature appeared behind Yue and Yun shouted at him to run. It looked like a giant sea monster. Yue looked behind and quickly started running towards the shore. He tried his best to swim as fast as possible. Meanwhile, the two girls were nearer to the shore than Yue was, so they reached there faster than him and were safe. Yue knew he couldn't reach back in time if he kept swimming, so he had no other choice except to use his Keelan abilities to help him. Once again he shouted Lin, and a pair of magical bright green wings appeared on his arms. Before he knew it, he was up in the air flying above the deep sea and running from the mysterious creature below him. When Yun and Ching saw him flying in the air, they were fascinated. It was truly a sight to see, because the wings were magical and looked extraordinarily cool. Once Yue was about to reach the shore, suddenly he felt a strong force pulling him back into the sea. He could not resist the force because it was too strong for him, so he pushed the ruby on his necklace to call Tiger, and also touched the bracelet Master Zagru had given him. He knew the bracelet would help him, but what he did not know was that the creature behind him was the nine-headed deep sea Hydra. The deep sea Hydra gained its second head after it had turned 2,000 years old, and then after that, it gained a head every 1,000 years. The Hydra in front of Yue was at least 9,000 years old, so it was a fully nine-headed one. Its only weakness was that it could only stay inside waters to be powerful. If it left the sea, its strength would reduce to one-tenth of its original strength. If the Hydra left the sea, Yue's protection aura would easily overcome the Hydra's strength, and Yue would win the fight. However, once the Hydra turned 10,000 years old, it would not be limited by the sea anymore, and this Hydra was on the verge of being that old. But inside the sea, it was going to be an interesting fight between the Hydra and the rookie ink killin, Yue. Even though Yue had the Qilin orb and the Serira bracelet, he stood no chance against the humongous Hydra. His Qilin powers had only been awakened recently, and he hadn't reached his true potential to fight the deep-sea Hydra. 
But any of that did not stop Yue from fighting. He was dedicated to fighting the beast and even put his life on the line for the safety of his two friends. He repeatedly shouted, Lin, and immense amounts of energy were released from his core. Soon, he became exhausted. But he was still not ready to die until Yun and Qing were safe from the horrors of that beast. He activated his cloud climbing step ability to hold off for a while. Suddenly, one of Hydra's heads came rushing towards him and tried to bite him through its jaw, but a bright flashing wave of energy came and pushed Yue away and saved his life. It was Shudong, Tiger. He was dressed in heavy armor which looked like it was from a TV show about history. It looked majestic on him, and he seemed pretty strong at that moment. Yue shouted at him to get rid of the beast and save him and the girls, so Tiger went at full speed and hit Hydra's face with his sharp clawed gloves. After one attack, Tiger told Yue that it was over. Yue thought he had killed the Hydra with only one attack, and the danger was over. But actually, it was over for them. According to Tiger, the Hydra was too strong even for all the patron saints combined. Tiger had lost hope then, and he knew nothing could be done. So when Yue knew they were going to die, he thought of a plan. He told Tiger to take the two girls away to safety while he held off the beast and kept it busy. He was ready to die an honorable death and save his friends. Yue channeled all his energy into a single ball of unimaginable power and let it all out on the Hydra. He used the descendants of Chilin to create a very concentrated core of energy around him to absorb the Hydra. In moments, the whole Hydra had vanished and only Yue remained. Tiger rushed at Yue and held his weak body in his arms. He knew what Yue had just done. With all that power, Yue had absorbed the Hydra into his own body. This was a good thing, but only for everyone else, because the Hydra would soon burst out of Yue's body and kill him with itself. Yue did that to save everyone else at the cost of his own life. Tiger quickly took him to a quiet place and put his body beneath a tree. Yue knew he was going to die soon and so lit up one last cigarette. Soon, Ruyu came to them and asked Yue what had just happened. She was very angry at Tiger for not looking out for Yue and threatened to kill him if something happened to Yue. Ru Yu was not ready to let Yue die. She wanted to share her cloud power with Yue and save his life, and she also asked Tiger to do so. But there was still a problem. Once they both ran out of cloud power, the beast would still burst out of Yue's body, and they both would die with him. So that was not a good option at all. According to Yue, there was only one viable option. He asked them to destroy his body once he was finished with the cigarette. Ru Yu became even more angry upon hearing that, and started shouting at Yue about how important he was to them. Suddenly, some strange voices started to sound in Yue's head. It was Yeji. Yeji told Yue that there was still a way out of that mess. The bracelet that Master Zegru had given Yue could save his life. The Hydra inside Yue's body had become a mass of evil aura, and the Serira bracelet could suppress that aura. If the Hydra tried to attack Yue, it would be repelled by the bracelet, which could make it lose its intelligence. Once the Hydra was not intelligent anymore, it would be Yue's slave. So this way Yue could still live. After 10 minutes had passed, the Hydra came out in Yue's mind. If the Hydra wasn't 9,900 years old and that powerful, it would take him two hours to come out in Yue's mind. When it was out, it told Yue about the power of the Serira bracelet and cursed the bracelet. The Hydra instantly turned into a small green creature, which seemed lifeless because it had said bad things about the bracelet. The bracelet punished the beast and changed its form. When Yue saw the harmless creature, he started laughing, and Sieji was laughing too. The beast begged him to let it out. It was even ready to give Yue its treasures of the sea if he let it out. He promised not to attack his friends and family once it was out. However, Sieji told the beast that they couldn't let him out because Yue was not powerful enough to overcome the bracelet's powers. Upon hearing that, the Hydra became frustrated and tried to get out on its own but couldn't. After some chatting, Yue made an offer. He asked the Hydra to cultivate inside Yue's mind until he was strong enough to let him out. They agreed that once Yue reached 9 cloud level, he would let the Hydra out. Until then, the Hydra was offered to live rent-free inside Yue's mind. Hydra had no choice but to accept the offer, and so he did. Ruyu and Tiger couldn't believe that the Serira bracelet was that powerful. Once the Hydra was taken care of, everyone went back to their lives. The field trip came to an end and Yue and the others returned to the university campus. One fine afternoon, Yue was feeling extra kind and decided to make ramen for the girls. He was not good at cooking, but he was a master at making ramen. When he was done making the noodles, Ching came into the dorm right then. She did not look like she was in a good mood. Out of the blue, Ching asked Yue to move out of their dorm room. When Yue heard that, he thought she was just joking and someone bullied her, so he offered her the ramen noodles. Ching instantly smashed the ramen bowl onto the floor and it broke into pieces. She shouted at Yue that ever since the field trip, Yun was acting weird around Yue. There was something that bothered her, and so to save their relationship, Ching had to ask Yue to leave. However, Yue was not happy at all. 
and not ready to leave. He told Yue that the dorm room was not her house and she could do whatever she wanted. Yue was not going to leave. After that, Ching instantly left the room, and soon her voices of crying were heard outside the room. When Yue went outside to check, there was a group of huge boys and Ching had told them that Yue had harassed her in the dorm room. When Yue saw the group of boys who were angry at him, he knew it was pointless explaining the truth to them. Even Yun came to the scene and asked Yue what had really happened, but he was not bothered to explain anything to her. He was really upset about what Ching did to him, and so he left the dorm very furiously and sat on a bench outside the university. Yue had been expelled from Singbei University because of Ching's fake allegations against him. While sitting outside the gate, Yue lit up a cigarette and called Ming Ming's brother, Ji Dei, to let him know that he had been expelled. Yue got calls from Ru Yu and Yun as well, but he ignored them both. He was really disappointed about what just happened to him. After a whole night of drinking alcohol with Dei, it was the next morning and they both were really drunk. Dei suggested taking Yue on a trip. It was not actually a trip, but a mission in Country Yang for the Yanhuang souls. Yue had two choices either to go on the mission with Tiger, or go to the Dragon Villa and stay there. Since he did not want to hear Ru Yu's shouting at that time, he chose to go on the mission with Dei. The mission was actually a rescue mission for an expert scientist in genetics, Guan Ping. Guan Ping had made groundbreaking discoveries in genetics recently, and Country Yang could sabotage him due to his discoveries. So the Yanhuang souls needed to initiate a rescue mission for him. Four members of the Yanhuang souls were going on the rescue mission, including Ji Dei Yue was surprised by hearing that Dei was also a Yanhuang souls member. GD was the mechanic soul, a healthy boy was the cyber soul, a little girl was the flora soul, and a punk guy was the celestial soul. All three of them met Tiger and Yue soon after. The punk guy was actually the captain for that mission. He was the celestial soul. He went close to Yue and whispered to him that he was just dressed like that to disguise himself, and he was a classy person aside from that. The cyber soul was the expert of all technological matters, and he was the nerdy one. The Flora Soul was the little girl, but she was the strongest member of the souls because she was born a phonic. Yue was confused upon hearing that the little girl was even stronger than Dei. Then, the four Yanhuang souls and Yue boarded the flight to Country Yang. In the flight, Yue was scared again because he was afraid of heights. But when the pilot informed the passengers to fasten their seatbelts because the plane was going to encounter thunderclouds, Yue became even more scared. However, Yue instantly remembered that Xieji had told him his cultivation was closely related to his surroundings, and so if he cultivated in thunderclouds, he would get even stronger. When he started his cultivation, in moments, an extremely high-voltage electric shock hit him out of nowhere. Yue's cloud power became so strong that he couldn't control it anymore and he was getting shocked by electricity constantly. When Dei tried to help him, he got caught in the shock too. When the Hydra inside Yue's mind got to know about the electric shocks, it knew that if Yue died, he was going to die too. So the Hydra started to help Yue by spitting out shiny blue balls that looked like crystals. When the balls came in contact with Yue, they would absorb the lightning. The Hydra gave Yue many balls, and finally, the lightning ended. Hydra told Yue that the balls were his pearls of blue sea, and every 1,000 years it could create one. It had used all 9,000 years of its cultivation power to spit that many balls for Yue. Chieji also warned Yue to not do something stupid like that the next time. Then soon, the plane landed, and Yue was relieved to be on the ground. Suddenly, the punk guy came to Yue and told him that he had saved the entire plane from the lightning strikes. Yue was surprised by that, but also prideful upon hearing that. Soon, they reached a tall building in which they apparently had their headquarters located. It was heavily secured with fingerprint and iris authentication. The secretary there told the celestial soul, the captain, about the mission. Country Yang would have already killed Dr. Guan Ping, but he still had some research left so they didn't take action yet. Because Ping's research could prove fruitful for all of humanity, Country John had also sent their agents to investigate the matter. So this was a large-scale mission, and they needed to save the doctor. As the first step of the mission, Cyber Soul started his work. He was tasked with getting rid of all the satellites that Country Yang had positioned for information. But there were a lot, and it was nearly impossible to take care of all of them. When Yue heard that, he told them that he could try becoming invisible, and then the satellites would not matter. Yue tried to activate his Keelan suit, and it actually worked. Everyone else was amazed by that. There was some time for them to start their mission, so they all went outside to travel in the city for a few days and have some fun around. Outside, Jidei asked his master Yue to teach him the invisibility technique to make his missions easier. Yue mocked him by instructing him to say the word invisibility 10,000 times every day, and only then he could master it. Then finally, he told him that not everyone could learn that skill. He was the Zodiac King, 
so he had the ability to master invisibility, but others were physically not able to learn it. While they were chatting, suddenly a girl went rushing past them. She was being chased by three men in suits who had knives in their hands. Yue was blocking their way, so one of the three guys threatened to kill Yue too, and upon hearing that, Dade jumped in to save his master and punched the guy in the face. His punch was so strong that the guy fell far away onto the other side of the street. All three of the suited guys were beaten up badly by day after that. The Yan Huang souls and Yue left the scene immediately after saving the girl to avoid any unnecessary trouble with the police. On their way to explore the city, Yue and Ji Dei had a chat about some important matters. While chatting, Yue jokingly said that Dei would become his brother-in-law someday. Upon hearing that, Dei told Yue that it was impossible for him to marry Ming Ming. Yue became a bit sad because he thought he was not strong enough and good enough for Ming Ming. But after some hesitation, Di finally told him the real reason. Ming Ming was already engaged to someone. It was a very important political marriage for the state, so her father had to accept it. It was for the whole country's sake. Dei knew that Yue was a kind-hearted person, and he respected women, so he truly wanted him to be with his sister. Unfortunately, that was not possible anymore because Ming Ming was engaged. She was engaged with the son of Country Shi's president. Her father did that so they could stay on good terms with Country Shi because they had the strongest guardians of the West. Yue was devastated upon hearing that, and the misery could be seen in his eyes. Then the group went to eat some food, and because of Yue's sorrow at that moment, he ate 17 whole bowls of ramen in a moment. The reason for that was also because the cells in his body had been generating energy through fission after the electric shocks he suffered, so he needed more nutrients to function properly. After that, the group returned to the hotel to plan their moves. They knew that they couldn't use force to get into the doctor's facility because it would be heavily guarded. So they needed Yue's invisibility skills help. Yue was ready to help them, and he just needed to locate the doctor's exact position. After that, the souls would do the rest. Celestial Soul guaranteed Yue's safety before briefing him on the mission because he knew how important the King of Zodiac was. Celestial Soul wondered if Yue could take another person with him while being invisible. When he found out that it was possible for a small person, he told Yue to take Flora's soul with him. Yue was not interested in the idea because he thought he would have to take care of the small girl with him. But when Dei told him that she was the combatant in the group of souls, he could not believe that. Celestial Soul was the commander, Dei was the mechanic, Cyber Soul was the technological genius, and lastly, Flora Soul, the smallest one, was the combatant. She was among the top three combatants in the Yunhuang Souls, and even beat Dei in a fight within ten seconds. The Celestial Soul also gave Yue a mind-reading device through which he could contact them from a long range. They decided to start the mission after two days. Soon it was dark and everyone went to their rooms to rest. Yue could not sleep because of the thought of Ming Ming. Yue was not happy that a patron saint of the East was going to marry a person from the West. His ego was hurt a lot and he was not ready to allow that marriage. Dei also sat with him. And when he heard all that, he became concerned that Yue might do something troublesome for the whole state. Yue had a whole year to think of a plan, so he was not very bothered at that time. Dei could not believe that Yue was actually in love with his sister, and jokingly called him an idiot. Finally, the third day came, and they were ready to start their mission. Yue and Flora Sol were on their way to the target building, and Yue's hand was shaking and sweating from nervousness. The building was built with titanium alloy, and it could even sustain missile strikes. The facility was heavily guarded from outside too. Flora's soul told him to calm down and that she would save him from any trouble. Then they both went to the side to get invisible and start their mission. Suddenly, Yue's eyes saw a familiar girl trying to infiltrate the facility before them. She was the same girl they saved a few days ago when three suited men were after her. When she approached the security outside the facility, she knocked all four of the guys instantly with her punches and sheer strength. She was very strong and was trying to break in directly through the front gate. She was actually an agent from Country Jian. Yue told the other soul members that they had to act fast because if Country Jian took Dr. Ping before they could, it would be very hard to rescue him then. When he got the signal from the celestial soul, Yue picked up the Flora soul and became invisible with her. The mission had finally started. Meanwhile, back at Dragon Villa in Jing City, things were messed up. Ruyu was very angry at Tiger for losing Yue. They thought he was so disappointed by what happened to him at the university, he left everyone without a clue. Tiger knew that was not the case because Yue would not care that much about that thing. He was an open-minded person, according to Tiger. Right when Ruyu was shouting at Tiger, she got a call from Ming Ming. Ming Ming informed her about the things going on at her side. At the Buddha temple, things were going smoothly, and the new patron saints were cultivating quite quickly. Mo Di was already at two cloud level, and the other two were trying their best. Then Ming Ming suddenly asked Ruyu why she had let Yue go on a mission with her brother to Country Yang. 
When Ruyu told her that she did not know as well, Ming Ming became concerned about Yue's safety. She also begged Ruyu to not be mad at Yue because he was still a kid and that he had the heavenly fortune with him, so he would be safe. After they hung up the call, Ruyu and Tiger instantly booked the next flight to Country Yang and went to rescue Yue from the dangerous mission he was on. Back at Country Yang, the mission had already started. Dr. Ping was located on the third floor and heavily guarded with security. Since the girl who was Country John's agent had already infiltrated the facility, all the security went to the third floor, and Yue and Flora Sol followed her. When they were running, bright green bullets started firing from behind them. The bullets were from pulse guns, which could damage internal human organs. Yue quickly took cover and suddenly saw the girl dressed in black coming from behind them. She jumped through the men with the pulse guns and not a single bullet could hit her or harm her. Flora Sol knew the bullets were a hassle for Yue, so she decided to take care of them. A dense green ball of energy appeared and Flora Sol left Yue, so she became visible again. She stood in the middle of all the security guards, and then suddenly, some mysterious branches appeared, and she grasped all the guards with those branches. The guards were confused when they saw all the chaos happening and couldn't help themselves. The branches held the guards in the neck, and each one of them died soon. After that, the girl dressed in black appeared at the scene and asked Flora Sol who she was. When Yue saw that, he also became visible and asked the girl for her information. The girl knew Yue and Flora Sol were from the Yan Huang Souls and that they were also after the doctor. She even recognized Flora Sol as the famous green fairy of the Yan Huang Souls. Flora Sol wanted to get rid of her and kill her, but Yue was smart and had another idea. If they both became invisible, security would only target the girl. So Yue quickly grabbed Flora Soul and ran while being invisible. Yue's plan was actually working, and the girl was clearing through security for both of them. But suddenly, something unexpected happened. The girl ran into a group of Soul Eaters, which Country Yang had hired to protect the doctor. Soul Eaters were Country Yang's secret soldiers, and they had five ranks, Hunt, Shadow, Thorn, Dark, and Flux. The three of them located there were Dark Rank Soul Eaters. The soul eaters were eager to demolish the girl's body and have a taste of her. But when she told them that Yan Huang's souls were with her too, they backed off and became careful. Flora Soul quickly told Yue to hide somewhere, and she revealed herself in a big ball of branches with two huge green hands beside her. The soul eaters were scared when they saw Flora Soul, because she was one of Yan Huang's soul's most famous assassins. Flora Soul started grasping the soul eaters one by one in her huge hands and threw them away with full force. She even crushed two of them in between her hands. When she thought she had killed them, suddenly they both broke through her huge hands with some mysterious weapons. The Soul Eaters had prepared special corrosive blades to deal with Flora Soul that time. The Soul Eaters were already prepared for Flora Soul's attack. They had cleared the place and left not a single leaf there, because Flora Soul's abilities were related to the forest, and she needed leaves to fuel her attacks. They took out their new blades and rushed closer to her to finish her off. Just when they were about to demolish her body, they saw a huge dragon coming towards them from behind. It was the King of Zodiac, Yue's Ink Kaleen. He modified his Kaleen Ruby into a brick and smashed the Soul Eaters' heads with his modified martial arts of brick. Yue attacked each of the three members of the Soul Eaters one by one. He smashed their heads with his new brick made of ruby. Then he used his Kaleen ability of thunder he had cultivated earlier. The lightning almost paralyzed one of the guys, and after that, Yue hit him with his ruby brick to finish him off. Yue killed two of the Soul Eaters right there, and only one was left. The last guy tried to attack Yue from behind and sneaked up on him. He was about to slash Yue with his sword, but Yue saw it coming and activated his Kilin Arm ability right then. A bright flashing light appeared right when Yue punched the guy upwards. His punch was so strong that the guy's head went right through the roof, and he got stuck there with his body hanging beneath. By seeing all that action, Country John's agent girl became amazed, and could not believe that Yue was the same ordinary guy who saved her a few days ago. He got rid of three Soul Eaters by himself without any hassle. She tried to approach Yue, but Flora Soul came between them to save Yue. She shouted at the girl to run away, but since her voice could only be heard through the communicator, the girl could not hear her. Still, when the girl saw Flora Soul, she backed off and ran away somewhere else. Yue had used up all of his cloud power because of his pride and rage right then, so he was going to be weak for a while after that. Flora Soul thought he was going to die, but that was not the case. He just became a bit weak. After that, they went to the doctor's room, which the Cyber Soul told them through his hacking skills. Cyber Soul hacked into the system, and the heavy metallic door guarding the room opened slowly. The both of them went inside the room and saw the doctor in the corner, but there was also heavy security rushing towards them. Yue instantly used his Kilin Orb's withdraw ability. The orb had an inventory space inside it which could store anything. So he absorbed Dr. Guanping and stored him in the orb's inventory. 
After that, he quickly picked up Flora's soul and became invisible, and rushed outside through the door. Yue called Ji Dae to get them a getaway car instantly outside the building. Meanwhile, Country Yang's forces were puzzled and started looking for Yue. Just when Yue was about to approach the getaway car, his cloud energy ran out, and his invisibility ended. Two more soul eaters located on top of the building saw him and quickly rushed to attack him. They were hungry for revenge. Yue dropped off Flora's soul and told her to leave in the car, while he looked back to fight off the soul eaters. The soul eater was about to hit Yue with his spear, but out of nowhere, a big blue bolt of energy came through and saved Yue. It was Tiger once again. The other soul eater saw what happened to his mate and he became furious. Just when he was about to jump in to attack Tiger, he was burnt to ashes by a big blast of fire. It was Ryu's energy, and she had also come to save Yue in full fury. When both the soul eaters were dealt with, Yue, Dei, and Celestial Soul fled from the facility. After an hour of driving, they stopped at a quiet place to pick up Celestial Soul and change cars. Just then, Tiger and Ryu joined them flying from above. Yue was happy to see Ryu, but she was not. She punched him and he fell back onto the car. Flora Soul tried to help Yue through her abilities, but Tiger advised her not to mess with Ryu at that point. Yue told everyone that they were friends, and so the fight stopped before even starting. All five of them sat in the car and D started driving back. Everyone had a different thought in their minds, and the mood in the car was quite tense. Once they reached the hotel, Tiger and Ryu were pissed at Yue for going on a mission alone without them or Ming Ming. On the other hand, the Celestial Soul was interested in the rescue of the Doctor. He could not see the Doctor with them, so he became a bit concerned. But then Yue suddenly let Dr. Ping out from his Keelan orb. The Doctor was amazed too by the fact that Yue put him into a stone which could fit in his hand. After that, Yue was feeling very proud and summoned the zodiac signs of tiger and dragon right there to show the Yanhuang souls the power of the patron saints. A moment after that, he revealed to everyone the true identity of the doctor as well. He summoned the doctor's zodiac sign, which was a dog. This meant that Dr. Ping was also a member of the patron saints. On finding that out, the doctor was very frustrated by the fact that he had been researching himself this whole time. The thing he thought would influence the whole of humanity was actually himself. He was a patron saint. Soon after that, everyone left Country Yang and returned to Jing City by separate flights for safety reasons. Before leaving the Yanhuang souls, Yue was thanked by every member. Even Flora Soul was admired by Yue's help and thanked him personally, and by seeing that Tiger got jealous. Ru Yu, Tiger, and Yue sat in their car and were on the way back to Dragon Villa when Ru Yu offered Yue two choices. She knew what had happened back at the university and so told Yue that she could make Yue fit back in the university or she could make Ching pay for what she had done to Yue. But Yue did not want to hurt any one of his friends, so he insisted Ru Yu not to harm her friend and suggested another way. He wanted to work a job and earn money himself because he did not like studying anyways. Yue had one requirement though, he wanted beautiful girls to be in his workplace, and only then he would do the job. Ruyu had to agree to his demands because she had no other choice. Yue had gained a lot from the mission he just came back from. On top of the experience, the most important thing was the help from the Hydra. He gave him nine blue sea thunder orbs, which were very beneficial for his cultivation technique. He no longer had to cultivate four cloud types at the same time due to the orbs, he only needed to cultivate two types. The thunder orbs would automatically level up with his cloud level as well. Yue was appreciating the thunder orbs in his room at Dragon Villa. When the Hydra in his mind heard that, he was disappointed because his 9,000 years worth of cultivation went directly into Yue's hands. Hydra only had one-tenth of his cultivation power left after that. He was pissed that Yue messed up with his cultivation technique, which attracted thunder in the plane. Hydra could help him without giving him the orbs if he had some more time. But when Zieji told Hydra that he had become a divine beast and was no longer an evil beast, the Hydra jumped from excitement. However, he then asked Yue for power, but Yue could not do anything. He did not have the energy to free the Hydra and give him power. Upon seeing that the Hydra was sad, Yue offered him his apologies and told the Sieji and Hydra to work together and cultivate together. That way, they could achieve more power and have fun. Sieji also suggested a way of giving the power back to Hydra. Keelan Adapter was a tool that could let the user transfer his power to his familiars. This way, while in the water, Yue could give his power to Hydra and control him. He could then transfer all nine Thunder Orbs into Hydra and make him strong. By hearing that, Hydra instantly agreed to be friends with them if they found the Keelan Adapter and helped him. That way, he could become one of the strongest beasts, with two types of cultivation and his 9,000 years worth of power. Yue and Hydra made a deal that until Yue found the Keelan Adapter, the Hydra would be under his command. While the three of them were chatting inside Yue's mind, Suddenly someone knocked at the door of his room. It was Ru Yu. 
She came into Yue's room and stood with the window for five whole minutes before telling him that she would spend the night in Yue's room. Yue froze and lost his mind when he heard that from a beautiful girl, Ru Yu. When Yue asked her if she had fallen in love with him, as expected, she became very angry and shouted at Yue to not think of her like that. She was actually there because she wanted to watch Yue cultivate in the night. Yue did not like the idea but had to agree, or else she would not let him in a company with beautiful girls as co-workers. So they both had a deal, and Ruyu took him to meet his future boss, a beautiful girl named Lan Ya. Lan Ya was dressed in professional attire, and was even taller than Yue. After seeing her, Yue thought he would be working at a model company, but he was wrong. It was actually a lingerie company where Ruyu had gotten him a job at. He became very confused about his placement at a company like that, and Ruyu knew her devious plan had worked. She had deliberately placed Yue at a job at the company, so he would feel uncomfortable and not act inappropriately anymore. But what Ruyu did not know was that it was Yue's dream job when he grew up. He could not fulfill his dream because it was an absurd thing for a man. But Ruyu had made his dream come true. He was very excited and totally ready to take the job. This made Ruyu's excitement fall because Yue was happy about what she had done to him. Lanya hesitantly gave Yue her business card and called him to work the next morning. Yue showed that card to Ruyu and mocked her for helping his dream come true. After that, Yue went running back to his room with happiness all over his face because he had won. Ruyu could not make him embarrassed and instead he embarrassed her by showing love for the job she had chosen him to do deliberately. Ruyu also came to his room soon after, and they both sat on the bed. Ruyu was ready to watch Yue cultivate, but had her eyes closed. That was because she could feel things and was more sensitive than a normal person. After some resistance, Yue agreed to start cultivating. He cultivated the whole night, and it was finally the next morning. He focused on fire cloud power and wind cloud power, and by one night of cultivation, 80% of his power had been recovered. Ruyu could feel that Yue had become much stronger from the last time she cultivated with him. On the breakfast table, Yue ate 14 pancakes, 9 tea eggs, 6 bowls of soy milk, and 7 bowls of wontons. According to Uncle Joe, he ate the amount of food that 7 people would eat normally. Even Ruyu was concerned, but let him eat to restore his energy. 30 minutes later, Ruyu left for work and instructed Uncle Joe to drop Yue off at work too, but only once. After that, Yue would have to go by himself on a bike. When Yue found out that the company was 30 kilometers away from Dragon Villa, he did not like the bike plan anymore. Soon they reached the building. It was the same building where Ruyu worked too, and it belonged to Long Yu Group. Uncle Joe dropped Yue off and gave him Ruyu's business card if he needed any help from her. When Yue saw every other member there, he felt out of place because everyone else was dressed very formally. Yue also wore his best clothes, but they were informal. He then approached the design department manager's office. He knocked and went inside the office to a familiar site. The design department's manager was actually Miss Wen from his university, whom he met when he first came into the university. She was also surprised upon seeing Yue and did not expect him to be at a place like that. Miss Wen was working at that company because it paid a lot more than the university, and Yue had the same reason too. Both of them wanted to make a living, and so coincidentally found themselves at the same company. She also heard the news about what happened to Yue at the university dorm and asked him about that. Yue did not bother to answer that question because he knew she would not believe him. Soon, Miss Wen advised Yue to read some books on lingerie as he was on his probation period for three months. Yue was very interested in reading the books but became bored soon after. It was finally evening and everyone was leaving for home. Yue was still sitting in the library reading books when Miss Wen found him and offered him a ride home. When she found out Yue lived near the airport expressway, she thought he was from a rich family. But he told her that he was an orphan and was living at a rich friend's place, and that made Miss Wen feel sorry for him. She also told Yue to call her by her name Wen Ting because they were colleagues at that place. However, when they reached the car park, Yue decided it was better to go alone. So he apologized to Wen and started walking back. On his way, he realized that the job was actually not easy, and it was tough to be a designer for a lingerie company. When he heard people on the street talking about going back home, a sorrow filled his heart because he did not have a home. He was the Chilin with no home. While he was in his deep thoughts, Wen started honking at him from behind in her car. She told him to quickly get in and that she was taking him to dinner. Yue sat in but was confused because a manager would not take a newbie to dinner on the first day. Wen was also an orphan, and so she felt sympathy with Yue and decided to have dinner with a fellow loner. On their way to the restaurant, she advised Yue to not care about the past and keep working hard for a better future. Yue was so inspired by her talk that he thought she was interested in him, so he quickly asked her to be his girlfriend. But when the words got out of his mouth, he realized what he had done. He had just met Wen and asked her to be his girlfriend. He panicked and thought she was going to tell him to leave right then, but she didn't. 
She wanted to start off as friends and told Yue to be her friend first. Yue could not figure out if that was a yes from her side or a no. She explained to him that they should remain friends for then, but things could change in the future. After some chatting, Yue found out that Wen wanted him to make a move on her. She wanted him to show her that he was interested in her. After that, Yue was ready to do anything to win her. On their way to the food court, she switched plans and told Yue that he was going to pay for the food, as he was the one who wanted to win her. In order to win a girl, you must treat her to good food. Yue knew he was broke but could not miss the chance, and so agreed to pay. When they reached there, Wen started off by eating some spicy crayfish. It did not have any effect on her stomach, and so the next place they went to was the ramen shop. The ramen did not kill her hunger because it was a small bowl, so then she asked Yue to take her to get some chicken wings. Yue could not believe how much Wen could eat and called her a glutton. When other people on the street heard that, they started talking about Yue not being good enough for her. Hearing that, Yue took her to get some beef stew as well. At the end, they had spent more than 1,000 Wen at the food court, and Yue was almost broke after that. However, Wen was happy because she had a good time with him. She even treated him to a burning ice cream before leaving the place. On their way back, Yue mocked her for eating like a little girl and made fun of her. She asked Yue if he really wanted to become a lingerie designer, but Yue told her that he was only there for the three months probation period pay and would leave after that. Suddenly, he got a call from Ru Yu when they were in the car. She was pissed at him again because it was very late and he was not back. Yue was fed up with all the shouting and decided to end the call and not go back home. He powered off his phone and wanted to stay with Wen, but Wen suggested Yue to go back home and meet Ru Yu because she was his friend. There might be an emergency and she might need Yue back. So she took the route towards the airport expressway to drop Yo off. Soon they reached Dragon Villa, and she dropped Yue off right outside the gate. Before leaving, he wondered if she was interested in him after the meal he treated her to. But she was rock solid, and told him it wouldn't be that easy. Then just as he was about to enter the gate, Ji Dae pulled up outside the gate in his huge military jeep. Ruyu had told him that Yue was not coming back to Dragon Villa, but he still came to check, and coincidentally found Yue right there. Dae's father... The commander of the military of Yan Huang Republic wanted to meet Yue, so Dae was there to pick him up. His father wanted to give Yue some rewards and know about the research of the doctor they rescued. In the car, Yue told him about his new job, an internship at a lingerie company. Dae was very inspired by hearing that his master was working at a company like that to make ends meet and was not relying on help from Dragon or any other person. Soon they reached Dae's home and Yue met his father there. His father was a very straightforward man, and without any side talk, he told Yue why he invited him. Because Yue had done a great job by rescuing a very important doctor, he offered Yue one wish. Yue was allowed to request anything that was within the commander's power. Surprisingly, Yue asked for him to be assigned to a military base for one month. He was about to ask to cancel Ming Ming's engagement, but decided that it would hurt the whole country. Yue wanted to work on his physical strength and training, and thought a strict military base would be the best place. The commander was really impressed by Yue's determination and decided to give him a four-soul token. With that token, Yue was able to command any group of 100 troops in the country's military. That could be a group of 100 soldiers, 100 planes, or 100 tanks. Yue could command anything. Above all that, Yue could even avoid the death penalty if he faced any charges. This meant that the commander knew Yue's importance to the whole country and entrusted him with such a huge power. The commander had assigned Yue to the country's most strict base. Only seven people in history had passed all three stages of that base and succeeded. There had even been deaths of people while training there. It was indeed the harshest base Yue could request. After knowing that, Yue got unexpectedly excited, and so Dei dropped him off at the Dragon Villa. Yue went to his room and found Ruyu cultivating her technique right there. Yue apologized to Ruyu about his behavior on the call and also told her about what happened at Ji Dei's place. He also told Ruyu about his request to the commander. He did not want to burden the patron saints by being a weak ruffian zodiac king, so he wanted to train hard at a strict military base. On hearing that, Ryu instantly gave him permission to go there. She was surprised by Yue's change in personality and was looking forward to his change in strength. Then she reminded him of the deal they both had going on. If Yue could beat Ru Yue, he could command her to do whatever he wanted. After this, Yue became even more motivated, and they both started cultivating. They cultivated the whole night, and the next morning Yue was fully prepared to leave for the military base. Ruyu was not concerned about his safety that time because she knew he had changed. Back at the Buddha temple in Tibet, things were going pretty smooth. Vol and Xiao Yi were cultivating with random small fights in between, and Dr. Ping, Dog was there too. Dog came to the Buddha temple after everyone else but was still very strong. He was stronger than Vol and Xiao Yi already. Vol's teacher Mo Di was there cultivating too, 
and Xiao Yi would get mad by the fact that Vol was interested in her. Suddenly, Master Zagru felt a weird fluctuation of energy from somewhere. From that fluctuation, he instantly figured out that Yue had changed. He was no longer a ruffian and a loser, but the king of Zodiac. Yue was finally acting like a king. Soon after that, there was good news at the Buddha Temple. Modi just reached four cloud level and was progressing quite fast. With that pace, she could surpass Tiger very soon, but Master Zagru knew it would be hard to cultivate after four cloud level, and she would slow down. It was still impressive for the patron saints to have another strong woman besides Dragon. Ming Ming was also working her hardest to improve. Bull was also at one cloud level and working hard because Yue had motivated him a while back. However, Xiao Yi was the only one who was still stuck and couldn't break through. He did not reach one cloud level at that time and was not really interested in cultivation. Master Zagru was not really worried about those two because the dog had also broken the four cloud level. They had dragon, tiger, rabbit, and dog for the assembly coming up. Ming Ming was also an upcoming strong patron saint in Zagru's eyes. However, something about her bothered him. Master Zagru had a bad feeling about Ming Ming's future, but he could not pinpoint what it was exactly. However, he consoled Ming Ming because every patron saint was destined to be faced with difficulties. So if she stayed strong, it would not be a big problem. Ming Ming also felt a bit sad because Yue hadn't called once to check up on her. She had been gone for more than a month and Yue did not bother to know how she was. But more than disappointment, she blushed, and Master Zagru asked her what it was about, but she dodged his question. Inside the temple, Xiao Yi had snatched Vol's phone from him, and they were running like cat and mouse. Xiao Yi was irritated because Vol had a crush on his cousin Mo Di, and he also had her photographs in his phone. Upon seeing that, Ming Ming asked Master Zagru if two patron saints could become a couple. She blushed when Zagru told her that two patron saints could get married, and their private life would be affected positively because of their zodiac signs. Ming Ming knew she blushed because of Yue, but she was not ready to accept that. Meanwhile, Yue was suffering in a desert far away, where there was not a single cloud in the sky. He was training under the burning sun in a military base in the desert. Yue was fully determined to become stronger for the upcoming assembly. On his first day at the military base, he was given a 100 kilograms bag to put on and run in the desert. That was the start of his inhumane training. When he came back late from the desert run, he was given a punishment. Yue opted to take the punishment solo, but then he was beaten up by a group of guys together. By choosing to go solo, he actually put himself alone against a group of soldiers. He even tried to use his special Keelan abilities to punch the guys, but they were not affected at all. It was just a normal day for them. They were used to beating kids with special abilities. However, Yue's injuries would heal faster than everyone else because of his Keelan regeneration ability. So after a few days of rough training, he finally beat those guys in a solo fight. But when the military base commander found that out, he banned Yue's abilities. He was not allowed to use his abilities from then onwards. Even then, Yue did not lose his determination and motivation. After a few weeks, all four types of his Keelin technique broke to two cloud level, and he beat 23 special force soldiers alone without using his abilities. The next stage was to drag one ton of weight 50 kilometers into the desert, and because of the progress he had made, he did not hesitate at all and was still motivated. A whole month passed, and Ruyu was at the airport waiting for the guys from the Buddha temple. She welcomed Ming Ming, Vol, Mo Di, Xiao Yi, and Dr. Ping on their breakthrough and progress, and then took them all to Dragon Villa to stay until the assembly. Just an hour after that, Yue also arrived at the Jinx City Airport, but he was alone. He even vomited because of his fear of heights, but he was happy because he was a stronger person than before. In fact, he had improved a lot in terms of physical strength and capabilities. As he was about to leave the airport, suddenly Yue saw a familiar face. It was Shen Yun from his university dorm. Yun was there to pick her grandpa from the airport, who was the head of the Shen family, Shen Zhuo. She came and greeted Yue and was about to talk about Qing, but Yue stopped her and told her he was a changed man and that trouble was in the past. He was not bothered by it anymore. After some chatting, Yun's grandpa finally arrived and met with both of them there. As soon as Yue greeted him, he suddenly fell to the floor and made an excuse to leave the two of them alone. Yue seemed to be a weak Keelan to them, but he was still important for their family because he was the most important patron saint. In fact, he was actually stronger than he showed himself to be. He wanted to fool the head of the Shen family into thinking that he was a weak Keelan so that he could show his real power at the assembly coming up. Outside Dragon Villa's gate, Yue called Ruyu to surprise her. When she found out Yue was just outside the villa, she could not believe it because she couldn't feel his presence. This proved that showing off as a weak person was actually working for Yue. Then, he met his junior Vol and they both hugged each other while Xiao Yi also came and greeted Yue. Yue also met Ruyu and Ming Ming, and as always, Ruyu was mad at him for not answering her calls and letting her know where he was for a month.
At Tianxiang Mountain, Mr. Shen was preparing for the assembly and the visit of the patron saints. Meanwhile, Ru Yu and the others were happy to see Yue, and they all chatted for a long time. Ru Yu reminded everyone of their true mission at the Tianxiang Mountain. The assembly was solely for the purpose of the families taking the leader position from the patron saints. Ru Yu knew a fight would break out at the assembly at some point, and she was ready with tiger and dog to fight everyone. She instructed Ming Ming and Mo Di to not fight with them and focus on the safety of Yue and everyone else. The patron saints needed to display their dominance and make all four families submit to their leadership and power. This way, they could show their power to the beasts in the east as well. All the other benefits aside, their main goal was to keep Yue safe from the families. A few days passed, and it was finally the day everyone was waiting for. It was the assembly day at Tianxiang Mountain. The Luo family's head, the Shu family's head, the Zhou family's head, and the Shen family's head all were in agreement on one thing. They did not want a bunch of kids to lead them. They wanted to see the patron saint's power first, and then decide if they would obey them. The Shen family's head had already met with Yue, and he thought of him as a ruffian and a loser, so he was not ready to be commanded by a king like that. Soon, dragon and tiger came to the Tianxiang mountain from the high night skies, and dog came from the forest near the mountain. The heads of the four families saw them, and they knew that dragon could not fight them alone, so they invited her to come down with her fellow patron saints. The head of the Shen family was interested in negotiating with Dragon, but she knew his true intentions. He was never there to negotiate, but he wanted to take power and leadership from the patron saints. After arguing with Dragon, he asked for the King of Zodiac, but what he did not know was that the King of Zodiac was there for a long time. Yue was invisible and chilling just beside the heads of the four families, and upon Tiger's call, he revealed himself to everyone. As soon as they found him standing beside them, they were confused and scared of what would happen to them. When Yue was finally out, he told everyone that the head of Shen family did not spend any resources to figure out the King of Zodiac's true identity, but Yue was his granddaughter's classmate. This humiliated Mr. Shen in front of everyone. Then Yue offered him to start the fight by sending out one guy from each team at a time. However, the head of another family intervened and apologized for what happened in the past. Since in the past, around 100 years ago, the assembly had ended in a disaster because of the four families' fault. He apologized to the new king of Zodiac for his ancestors' mistakes. Yue forgave them, but on one condition. He wanted them to gain the people of Yan Huang's forgiveness. Yue commanded the four families to kowtow and admit in front of the whole East that the patron saints were the strongest and the true leaders. Mr. Shen's son, Shen Yue, shouted at Yue as soon as he heard his condition, but his father calmed him down. The families were not ready to fulfill his condition, as it would mean utter disgrace for them to submit in front of the patron saints. It would mean the patron saints were more powerful than the four families and they did not want that, so instead they offered to fight. They would send ten people and there would be ten fights. The patron saints did not have ten people and they were short-handed. So, Ru Yu made them an offer that the patron saints would be allowed to send the same person multiple times to fight. This way they could fulfill all ten fights against the families. The families agreed, but Yue was also required to take part in at least one fight. Ruyu resisted, but Yue wanted to fight and show everyone his progress. That was the final deal, and everyone agreed. If the patron saints won the overall fight, the families would be under their command. Soon the first fight was ready to start. It was between Dragon from the patron saints and the leader of the Zhou family, Zhou Tianlu from the families. They both came to the center and were ready to face off with each other. The fight started off with Ruyu's first attack. She tried to attack Tianlu with her dragon claws, but he easily blocked them with his hands. After several blocked attacks, Ruyu only managed to scratch Tianlu's skin, and Yue was getting worried by seeing that. Tianlu was the Zhou family's head, and his elemental type was metal. He was like a walking shield, and so he could easily block off Ruyu's attacks. Tiger assured Yue to not lose hope because Ruyu would not give up that easily, and it was not easy to win from her. After Ruyu's attacks, Tianlu was ready to show off his skills. He started off with his matter control and metal solidification techniques. He ripped off stones from the ground and turned them into metal pieces, and then threw them all in Ruyu's direction. However, Ruyu dodged them all by flying high into the sky. In response to that, Ruyu used her dragon wing meteor shower to shower Tianlu with stone-like meteor pieces. This ability could easily kill a normal person, but not Tianlu. Although Tianlu felt a real challenge after a long time, it did not hurt him at all. Ruyu realized the fight was dragging on. She needed to save her energy for one more fight too, so she decided to use one of her best abilities, Dragon Domain. With a fiery attitude, she initiated Dragon Domain, but nothing happened. Upon seeing that, Tian Lu knew that he also needed to do something extraordinary to win, and he used his ability as well. A bunch of swords started flying towards Ruyu, 
Vol and Yue were scared when they saw a group of swords flying towards Ruyu. However, without any hesitation, she did some tricks with the air and all the swords stopped right before hitting her. She commanded the swords through her mind, which made them stop mid-air. After that attack from Tianlu, Ruyu finally summoned her dragon from the Dragon Domain ability, but she commanded the dragon not to hurt Tianlu and only destroy all of his swords. In the blink of an eye, all of Tianlu's swords vanished, except one. The one sword left shrank to the size of a pen, and Ruyu held it in her hand to assert dominance over Tianlu. Ruyue had actually reconstructed the matter after eliminating its impurities. Ruyu asked Tianlu to admit defeat because she did not want to hurt him with her dragon. Since Tianlu knew he had no ability to protect himself from the huge dragon, he had to admit defeat. He thanked Ruyu gracefully for showing mercy, and the first fight came to an end. After the fight, Ruyu asked Yue for his hand because she had to recover her cloud power somehow. She held Yue's hand tightly so she could recover her cloud power for the next fight. For the next fight, Tiger volunteered to fight from the patron saint's side, and he proudly inquired about the fighter from the family's side. But when Tiger found out it was the Shu family's head, he chickened out and asked for someone else to fight instead. The reason for that was that the Shu family's head was actually Tiger's grandfather. They did not look alike, but Tiger was actually that old man's grandson, and so he did not want to fight that guy. Shu Dong had left his family at a very young age and decided to go with Master Zagru. On top of that, his zodiac transformation was a heavy one, so his grandpa was unable to recognize him before the fight. His grandpa was very fierce and started the fight instantly. Mr. Shu was bothered by the fact that Tiger was only dodging his attacks and not fighting back. He thought that Tiger was showing mercy on him and thought of his grandpa as a weak person. Mr. Shu needed to show his power to the patron saints and also to the other three families, so he decided to use the Great Doom, a spell that costs the user his lifespan. By seeing this, Tiger instantly called off the fight and surrendered. He apologized to Yue and the others as he did not want to hurt his grandpa. This fight appeared to be a loss for the patron saints, but it also upset the balance of power in the four families. Mr. Zhu's win was not taken well by the other families, as they appeared to be less strong than him after the fight. So the head of the Shen family requested Yue as his opponent for the next fight. Mr. Shen knew the King of Zodiac was a weak Qilin at that time, so he specifically chose him as his opponent. Ming Ming did not like that, and she wanted to fight that guy instead of Yue. But if Yue backed off, it would hurt his ego and pride. So he told Ming Ming and the others to let him fight. Ruyu was not ready to let Yue fight Mr. Shen because she thought Yue was still physically weak. However, Yue had other views. Even if he lost that fight, it would not appear bad for the patron saints as everyone knew he was weak. However, if he won, it would greatly improve the patron saint's image. Yue was totally ready to fight the old guy. Yue distracted Mr. Shen by some pre-fight chatting, and while they were talking, he suddenly vanished. As Yue was invisible, Mr. Shen could not find him and fight him which was humiliating for him in front of the other three families. So he had to activate his mind radar technique, with which he soon found Yue within two feet of him with a brick in his hand, as if he was about to hit him with that brick. Mr. Shen mocked Yue for playing dirty and hiding in a fight with a brick. Upon hearing that, Yue was ready to show off the real strength that he had gained from the rigorous training. He punched Mr. Shen with so much force that he sent the old man flying off into thin air. Although Mr. Shen was impressed with Kilin's physical strength, he knew that Yue couldn't win with just physical force. On the other hand, since Yue had trained a whole month for this single moment, he was determined to use his physical strength in coordination with his abilities to fight the old man. Yue combined Thunder Keelan ability with his arm to make his punches stronger and more impactful. When Yue was about to attack Mr. Shen, he suddenly saw roots emerge from the ground and come towards him. Mr. Shen could control trees and plants like Flora Soul, but he was much stronger than her. However, Yue could easily dodge his attacks because he was much faster. While he was running from the roots and humiliating Mr. Shen, Yue had a devious plan in mind. He deliberately got caught in the roots of Mr. Shen and made himself look like he had lost. Ming Ming and the others got worried, but just when the old guy asked him to surrender, Yue used his Qilin Thunder ability. Very strong bolts of electricity traveled through the roots towards Mr. Shen, but he got lucky and dodged the thunder attack by jumping aside quickly. Mr. Shen's ability type was wood, as he could control trees and plants. This meant that he was resistant to thunder, so it was not a big deal for him to block off Yue's thunder ability and remain unhinged. When Yue found this out, he became even more determined to show off his strength and pride. Both of them were ready to fight with their full force and willpower. Yue soon figured out that the roots were actually connected to Mr. Shen's own feet, and if he damaged the roots, it would damage Mr. Shen as well. He used his Keelan Ruby Fire type ability on the roots, and it instantly hurt Mr. Shen. The old guy was surprised that Yue was a dual type Keelan. 
Yue hit Mr. Shen with several fire-type attacks and punches, but Mr. Shen was prideful that a street fighter and ruffian could not hurt him at all. Just when he said that, Yue took out a brick and combined it with his fire ability to hit Mr. Shen with a burning brick. When Vol saw that action, he was very impressed by his boss. But the heads of the three families knew that Mr. Shen was still holding back. Mr. Shen's strongest ability was his mind attacks. Mr. Zhu shouted at Mr. Shen to use his mind attacks before it was too late, and so he did. Mind attacks do not affect a person's physical body, but if a person was defeated in a mind realm, he would lose control of his body for a few moments, and this way, he would lose the whole fight. Mr. Shen used his mind attacks on Yue, and soon Yue was totally out of his mind and lost control of his own body. He was like a lifeless body standing in front of an old guy. Mr. Shen warned Ru Yu that he would kill Qilin if they didn't surrender, but Ru Yu decided to trust Yue. Yue was in a dream seeing his childhood, but he tried hard to focus on reality, and soon he figured out that he was on Tianxiang Mountain in front of Mr. Shen and could not move because of his mind attacks. Mr. Shen was about to hit Yue's lifeless body with Yue's own brick, but Yue dodged the attack very smartly. He grabbed the Hydra in his mind and forced the Hydra to take Mr. Shen's brick hit. Just like that, a bright green light shined, and Yue was free from the old guy's mind attacks. Mr. Shen was amazed by the fact that Yue was able to break out from his mind attack that easily. However, Hydra was pissed at Yue for making him take the hit. Then, Yue also asked the Hydra to help him get rid of Mr. Shen and win the fight. Hydra had to agree since he had made a deal with Yue. So, Hydra came out in the mind world of Yue in his full nine-headed form, and in the blink of an eye, destroyed the old man. Yue had won the fight and Mr. Shen ran away, but everyone else was confused. That was because to everyone else, the Hydra had appeared next to Yue's head in a very small size, and just by seeing the Hydra, Mr. Shen ran away. Everyone else was surprised that Yue had actually won the fight. When the head of the Luo family saw the nine-headed Hydra, he became very inspired and amazed by it. Since the Luo family cultivated the water element, he was naturally inclined to the sheer power of the Hydra. He quickly came to Yue and offered a deal. If Yue gave the man the Hydra, the Luo family would quit the assembly right away and obey the patron saints after that day. However, Yue was not interested in that deal, because he thought of Hydra as his friend. But Hydra did not have the same views and was pissed at Yue for calling him out for a small fight. After the fight, Yue came to Mr. Shen to mock him and show his dominance. Yue thought the patron saints had won the fights, because they took care of three families' heads, and only one of them was left. So he was about to leave the fight arena. But Mr. Shen cursed at him right there. When Yue heard that, his pride and ego got hurt, and he hastily made an offer to the family heads. He wanted to fight all four of the family heads at once and forget about the ten fight matches. If Yue could take their attacks, he would win. And they would have to show their respects to the East and not cause any trouble for the patron saints. There was no condition of obeying the patron saints, and Yue was not interested in that. If Yue was unable to withstand their attacks, he was ready to die. So it was basically a life-or-death situation for Yue. Ming Ming approached Yue and shouted at him for making such a stupid offer to the family heads, but Yue knew what he was doing. Yue finally had Senior Keelan's memories in his head, and he was not ready to see people disrespect Killin. He was ready to put his life on the line for the sake of Qilin's respect. So all four of the old men gathered around Yue and were ready to fight him. All four of them transformed into giant forms of their ability type and exerted excessive amounts of pressure just by their presence. They were so strong that they were afraid they would kill the Keelin once again like last time. On the other hand, Yue was also very strong, as he had trained rigorously to pass the third stage of his training. Yue just needed to combine all four of his abilities to unleash his true strength and capabilities, but he needed a lot of pressure to achieve that. If he got the right amount of pressure, he could break through the bottleneck in his cloud power. So when the four of the family heads were exerting excessive pressure on him, he knew it was the right opportunity for his four cloud power types to absorb energy. Even though it was hard for him to withstand that pressure, he needed to. Only that way could he break through the bottleneck. When the four old men decided to unleash their full powers on Yue, he used his Kilin Ruby to hold on for some more time. Everyone thought Yue would die, and even Ruyu lost hope. She called it suicide. The four old men thought they had won because Yue was on his knees about to fall down and die. Mr. Shen hit Yue's head with a brick to knock him out, and the four family heads were happy to win. All the other patron saints were about to fight the four men, but something unexpected started happening. The entire sky got dark, and a huge Keelan shadow appeared from behind the mountain. The pressure from all four of their abilities died down instantly, and one of the family heads got thrown away by the sheer presence of the huge Keelan. Right then, Yue got up with a black suit and some armor pieces.
He also had a graceful new necklace for his Kilin ruby. Yue's accidental breakthrough was history's first zodiac transformation of Kilin. The energy released was so much that a normal person would not be able to withstand it. At that point, Yue was even more powerful than Ruyu, because he was Kilin, and his cloud levels would make him two times more powerful than before. All the four family heads were actually pissed at Yue for still being alive, and were ready to use their attacks with full powers. They were not interested in holding back anymore. Just when they were about to unleash all four of their attacks simultaneously, Yue vanished. When Mr. Shen used his radar technique to find him, there were four bodies of Yue. They thought that only one of the bodies was real, but when Yue attacked each one of them, they figured out that all of the bodies were real, and it was one of Qilin's attack techniques. Yue tricked all four of the old guys and attacked them solo, which was easier for him and harder for them. Don't forget to like and comment for the next part. Join our Discord for the name of the book and subscribe for more videos from us.